so stoked. I got uh, the boys from uh, Spectrum K9 in the house again. It's What's great up? to be back. What's up, man? Yeah, but this time, uh, it, so this is going to be a second time because I had I had Ricky and I met about a year ago. A year already? And I feel like it was about a year ago. And uh, now we've got Steve in the house. Steve was the missing part of that, that duo. Absolutely. It's good to have you here, dude. Thanks, man. Stoked to be here. I'm stoked to have you guys, and not only do you get get you guys, we got we got all the Spectrum K9 <laughs> folks in here today. We got uh, all the ladies, including the dogs. We had some dogs in here, little puppy Kira, who's amazing, and Mama Cora, who's outside, and and uh, this, you know just the supporting crew. Seeing you guys work with the dogs a little bit, so those people that are watching on YouTube will see some of that stuff. We'll try to get some content out. Like, who doesn't love puppies? I know Everyone. it's it's always a little bit different working the puppies. I mean, seeing a Fully trained dog mm -hmm. do its thing is awesome, but watching a ten week old puppy that just came out of the womb yeah. do what it does is insane. Yeah, it's, the development process uh, is is. I don't want to talk about that because you guys have just started a breeding program. Um, well, and you've been working with it on this for a very long time, but it's it's yep. it's been in the works now and it's finally uh, coming to fruition. So I definitely want to get into that and talk about the pups. But yeah, it's just really good seeing kind of like because I. Cause I my experience around you guys is seeing the end result. Right. Obviously, with my own dog and working with you, Ricky, just in your team, just the things that can be done in a short period of time, given Absolutely. the know-how and the skill and the and the consistency. But to watch how fast these little guys, yeah. you know, just jump right in. So we'll we'll talk about that. Um, you know what I, I love about the the canine world is it's like a whole thing. <laughs> it's like a whole yeah. culture. It is. And when I had you on the last time, it opened up a whole new world to me. Like I knew about it, but then, you know, we had Icon on the show actually too. <laughs> Icon the dog was sitting in the, basically in the chair where you're sitting, Steve, <laughs> yeah. with the headphones on. Got a lot of attention. Absolutely. And, and uh, people reached out and, you know, they were, they were, I just kind of got a little bit more involved in the dog world. Yeah. Um, and then specifically mm -hmm. with you guys and trying to understand the business a little bit more, what it is that you guys do in terms of training police canines. Uh, because, man, that is a rabbit hole. Absolutely. Uh, that I found. A lot. <laughs> and I bumped into people, places even like as far as where it's shot show or whatever that had seen you guys, you know, the, the spectrum on the on the show before and in the you know, some of the Instagram stuff and dog trainers from other places in the country that train canines. Absolutely. And making a connection. Yeah. Which is what this show was all about in the first place. So here we are, full circle. Yeah, full circle for sure. All the way back again. And it's really cool because you're right. I mean, the the dog industry, the dog world, um, especially on social media is crazy. And what's really cool is what I noticed from the last podcast is that people come from all different facets of the dog world. I mean, we have pet dog people. We have, you know, the military type of guy fan that mm -hmm. is into Malinois, is like yeah. John Wick type of vibe. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then you got <laughs> um, the people, the sport dog people are doing PSA and Schutzend and you know, are really into the social media uh, regarding the dog world. And then you have the police canine handlers and the guys that are out there watching Ironsight podcast shorts <laughs> on YouTube at 2 a.m. in the morning in between calls. You know what I'm saying? Waiting yeah. for the next dog call to come out. So I've literally crazy. been stopped on the street. Just like, <laughs> you're the guy with the dog on the thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? It kind of thing. So, yeah, you're right. And, it, and I'll have, I have to be honest with you, some of it's a little weird, you know, when I get out there and I can you kind of look into the dog world or whatever, totally. uh, you know, but we had a really good, really good discussion about a lot of things. But one of the things I wanted to dig more into with you guys today was like the business of, of training specifically in the world of police canines. Right. You guys are heavily involved with that here in the Bay area. Absolutely. You guys yeah. got some roots, been Stanley. here, been here a while now and working with several departments. So we can kind of get into what it is that you do. Um, but one of the things that came up for me that I just wanted to kind of touch on that maybe people heard about that, that, uh, at the time when I talked to you, like, I was like, we got to get you both in the studio. And this was months ago. And it just finally, it's just finally happening now. This is how things go. For sure. You guys have been as busy as you have, but yeah. we were talking about this AB uh, 742, which was this assembly bill here in California that some, let's just say some politicians were trying to pass. Uh, the, the end, the long story short is it's gone away for now, for, for now, now. For now. <laughs> <laughs> but just in general, I guess the, the big overview statement was, it was basically going to take the use of police canines out of the mix. Right. Uh, and immediately like, Oh, I, I, I didn't quite understand exactly all of what was going on with that bill, but yeah. to me immediately knowing what I know, living where I live, seeing what I see and kind of being involved in the law enforcement community, first responder community as a whole, uh, 
That just sounded like a really bad idea to me. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, AB 742 definitely threw us for a whirlwind. I mean, we were shocked. Um, I, it, it was crazy to me that something like this was able to even move as far, as, as, far it as it did. as far as it got. Yep, right? yep. And Shocking. Uh, very quickly, I figured out that AB 742 was simply a vehicle that a politician was using to get his name out there. You know what I'm saying? Um, Banning police dogs would be huge for your career as a politician. Apparently, right? which fucking blows my mind. Right. Like, really? And, <laughs> and I think the, the biggest, you know, misleading concept with AB 742 is he was trying, the politician was trying to push the idea that um, dogs, police canines, um, all police canines, and the idea that they can apprehend criminals is a civil rights violation, right? Um, and I think, you know, that goes into a deeper hole for sure. But the idea that this politician was trying to use <clears throat> a less lethal tool that saves people's lives every day as a vehicle to trans uh, to basically transport himself to get out there and get his name out there is crazy. And, and that was definitely, definitely shocked Steve and I. Uh, we didn't see that coming, right? I mean, so the 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 bill essentially was going to take dogs out of the out of work, and then it was yeah. it started to get chopped up a little bit. Then yeah. it was like then it got really confusing. There's like, okay, well, we have to change this because we see this is not going to go where we want it to go. That being the politicians are pushing it. Right. Yeah. Basically, they started to chop it down to well, now okay, maybe we can use them, but they're we're going to put these rules in place right. as if there aren't any right. Slide of hand, dude. That's yeah, was. yeah. So yeah. talk. Let's talk about it for just a second because I think. Basically, the overview was, and you know, don't quote me, you'd have to read the bill because it, it's it's a lot of, let's say, shell games with yeah, words. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. That unless this person had committed a felony where it uh, that basically uh, inflicted harm on a victim, right? Uh, that was the first thing. Like, it, unless that had happened, you couldn't deploy your dog. Yeah, it was death or serious bodily injury. Okay. A felony that caused death or serious bodily injury. And the, or that, that was that was after though. That's so the re, the revision. That's what it really got revised it was, to. It was banned police dogs, right. and then it was we're not a we're not going to ban your police dogs, but we're basically going to ban them by making it damn near impossible for you to deploy the dog because to deploy the dog is the same damn near the same as as a shooting. So the the confusion I think comes in for people that don't understand this. Go well, that kind of makes reasonable sense to me. Like, why would you send the dog outside of you know something as serious as this? Sure. But where it got a little bit more confusing was is the in and or that dog might pose a threat or sorry the the suspect might pose a threat to that physical bodily harm death right to the officer right. or anybody else that might be like a bystander or whatever else right and the, which leaves a lot of fucking gray areas yes, gray yeah. area and it also took out the the reasonable officer part where basically it, it allowed for you, you can expand on this a little bit, but it basically allows for, instead of a police officer saying that was reasonable, it opens it up to anyone could say that was reasonable or unreasonable. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's Again, it's a lot of gray. I mean, it oh. makes sense, but it doesn't. Yeah, you know, and the other thing is there was a lot of little weird stuff also thrown in there on top of what you mentioned. As per usual. Yeah, like the whole like uh, unleashed dog or an off-leash dog. That was a big piece on the revision uh, is he made sure to mention an off-leash dog um, which is weird because it almost sounded like, and now an on-leash dog was the exception. So now, what, we're going to make a thousand foot leashes and put police yeah. canines on a thousand foot leashes and do exactly what we've been doing, right? So that was definitely shocking to me. Like, I was like, well, this doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? And I have handlers calling me and asking me like, hey, where do you think about this? Where's mm -hmm. this going? I'm like, dude, I don't know. It's changing like that, right? And the revision happened really quietly as well. Yeah. We literally woke up one day to a text message from a handler be like, hey, did you notice that it got revised? And I was like, what? And I hit up Steve and I'm like, dude, they completely revived, revised this um, and changed the wording. And uh, now they're basically just tying the handler's hands and getting them to the point where they have the police dog in their car. It's not against the law to deploy your dog on somebody, but you have to basically have the stars align in order to deploy yeah. your dog. Yeah, it's, it's con the, the confusion is compounded because diff there's different policy based on the department that you're working in, yeah. right? In terms yeah. of what is what is allowable, what's a what's a biteable offense, if right. you will, or you know, uh, and the the policy just in general about what happens after that or what happens before. Like, what are the steps I have to take in order to deploy the dog? Right. Because like, yeah. this is. 
I think this is another confusing piece for a lot of civilians out there that don't really understand this. That they like, yeah. okay, there's a guy running. I can, if I'm a canine officer, no. I don't have to run. I just oh, pop the back door and I can Not let the guy. All. Yeah. No, there's, it doesn't work like this. It's extremely intricate, right? And I think the other part that confuses people is uh, the normal yeah. everyday person believes that police canines, like you said, can just be sent on any resisting suspect. Um, or they- like Jaywalkers. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or, right. Something that could be very, very ambiguous. Yeah. The everyday person believes that um, there's state rules or state laws or maybe even federal laws. I don't know what people think about when you can and cannot deploy your police dog. Mm -hmm. And that's not true at all. It comes down to each and every department, right? You can have six departments clustered together all in the same county all within a five minute drive of each other. Mm -hmm. And every single department can have a different policy on what's acceptable to deploy your dog on and what's not, right? You know, a, a, a big department right here, local to us, can't deploy for um, a resisting suspect uh, that is wanted for a stolen car. Um, but the department right literally next right next door that bordering, borders bordering the entire city, city um, can. So it's a little bit weird. It's it's crazy, and I think a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah, I think this is again compounded by you know a lot of footage that you'll see. Again, you only see what's happening in the moment where whoever yeah. posted it decided to to start the video. Yeah, we don't know what happened before. We don't know what led up to this. We don't have a lot of information. And uh, let's be honest, it, while it's less lethal, you know, when you see a dog bite a suspect, it's a violent act. That's it yeah. should be. A use of force. It use is a force. use of force, right? Exactly. And, and it looks violent. Like, I'm just going to be be honest about it. Totally. For somebody that's ever been nipped or bit by a dog, they know that is very uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. But again, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what, ha what went into that before that, that right. really went down. And obviously there's no two incidents are ever the same. Nope. Everything's different. It's the yeah. same as if you're looking at officer, you know, bond, uh, sorry, officer worn body uh, cams for shootings or use of any use of force for that matter. So, yeah. That, so I don't want to spend too much time on that whole thing. I just wanted to kind of put it out there and cause I don't think a lot of people until we just went through it again, yeah. I didn't fully understand it. I had to read all of the stuff Absolutely. Again, and it's changed in the last, what, I mean, I think this thing, this thing hasn't been squashed more than like two months. Mm, about you sound about right. About yeah. about yeah. recent, very very recent. recent. So too recent. <laughs> squash for now. It's just another, as you mentioned, kind of like yeah. a political stunt. And that's it, the thing is, we took that as a win, but we all know that it's coming back next year. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, squash for it. now, but by no means is this fight over. Does yeah, that make sense? It's it's hard to qualify the, it as a win when it shouldn't have been no, a game in the first place. Absolutely. So. And the worst thing about it is that the way they rewrote that bill, if you were just a normal person on the street reading it, it doesn't seem crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a it's a serious crime. You know, serious bodily injury. As that, if, that seems reasonable. Yeah, right? totally. That's what I'm saying. But they before. don't understand what that actually means when it comes to when that handler can actually deploy his dog, mm -hmm. and it basically takes the tool completely away. And it makes it makes the decision making process when seconds matter. Yes. Right. In terms of those threats turning deadly 100%. versus being, uh, I guess, squashed, like right. being being taken away. That is. We're already, th th these officers are already in a tough enough position. Absolutely. Right. And there's a certain amount of training that can be trained. And then there's a certain amount of like, there's a judgment call yeah. that has to be made based on what they're seeing in real time. Um, and I'm mean, wondering when you get into like armchair quarterbacking, you know, all the stuff yeah. that, that, that you see out there, because that's what people want to do. They think they're experts. But um, yeah, it takes the dog out of the, the okay. tool away from the officer and it can actually create confusion and, I, we're going to see some things later. We're actually going to look at some some body cam footage and maybe we, we can walk through some of that stuff later in the Absolutely. show. But um, Handlers are already like afraid to deploy their dogs at some agencies, right? They're worried they're going to get Monday morning quarterback by their admin. They're worried, is this meeting the requirements to bite this guy? And then you have a an officer who needs to mm. make a decision in the seconds. And he's so worried about all the Cut other factors that are going to happen after he's the, he's the man in the arena doing the job, right? He's so worried about that. This is not just nice. It's not worth it. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna hold on to my dog for an extra 20 seconds and we'll try something else. Right. And that, that used to not be the case. And unfortunately, it's just the way some of this has evolved. And now you have officers that are, they're worried about their house, right? They're worried about keeping their house, keeping their job. This one bite, uh, whatever, we'll let that guy get away. We'll get it another time. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to say, like, there needs to be accountability to decision making. Absolutely. But at the same time, as when that accountability starts, when, when they're not being backed up 
by their supervisors or by the DA or yeah. by the people yep. when they when they have made the by any stretch of the imagination the best decision they could have made in that particular moment and then they're yeah their house yeah. they're getting civilly sued or whatever 100%. else that is a different story and obviously you know in a lot of areas a lot of places in the country the, you know our cops are not getting the support they need this just happens to be another one of those times where they're you're putting questions in their head about what why am i doing what i'm doing and should i even be out here like what what are we doing here the good news is it's gone away for now here in California. Yeah, we the can take a breath for now. The better news is, is there's guys out there that, that are training or there, and there's departments out there. There's there's um, companies like yours and there's the dogs that are training hard every day to be better, mm -hmm. right? 100%. Unfortunately, whenever, whenever, you, whenever you look at that, that's not all of them all the time. Absolutely. Right? It's not the reality. It just is what it is. Um, but you know, there are, you know, let's go back to, you know, kind of what you guys are doing in the business. You guys have done uh, a pretty stellar job of, here's the thing, like in terms of what you guys do and what that ultimately means in terms of responsibility, you know, out on, out on the street, uh, when I say, when I say that, I mean, literally speaking, when the dogs go out on the street, the reputation that you guys have is, uh, is notable. And you guys haven't been around for a long time. There's a couple of things notable here that I want to bring to the table if, for those people that hadn't listened to the previous podcast with, with Ricky and I. And that was a couple of things. One, one is that you guys are civilians mm -hmm. and you didn't come from, you're not officers. So you didn't come from inside the department. That is a tough barrier to break through. Absolutely. Very. It's extraordinarily tough at any level. And I know civilians that do train law enforcement officers and others, firearms training, combatives mm -hmm. training and things like that. And I think that's becoming more normalized that it's okay to do that. Uh, particularly when you look like the shooting aspect, people, they're going to the professional shooters to teach people how to shoot. Absolutely. You know, rather than the grizzled old, you know, guy that's been there as the, as the, uh, was the armorer first. And now yeah. is the, you know, now is the firearms instructor who's been there for 30 years or whatever and teaching the same stuff he learned from the guy that did the same thing right. 30 years before that. Totally. So you guys have broken through that barrier. You've made contact now and have contracts with several local departments throughout the state. Like when we look at sort of totally the Bay area and into even sort of central Northern California, um, we've, you have established dogs that have gone through entire cycles now, mm -hmm. dogs that started and then retired, correct? Yes, yes. So there's a track record. There's a, this is a little bit of a resume, but now there's a track record. Right. There's data there. Right. And now you were, you're starting to expand into the breeding program, yep. which now, which makes, Steve and I were talking about this, like, just makes sense. Like, totally. with all of this, it's like, now we're keeping, let's keep the dogs that do these great things that have established this reputation Let's control that. Right. right? Totally. Can we talk about this? Yeah. yeah. So traditionally, this, this business, I mean, this end of the business. Yeah. Traditionally in the police canine business, the vendor goes to Europe, does a trip, buys a bunch of dogs, brings them back, sells them to the police department. I would probably say that, I mean, I would say 90% of police dogs in the U.S. were born and raised in Europe. Um, yeah. What Steve and I have learned is that Europe is oversaturated or Europe is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like Europe is basically been- It's a pool that's it's a, it's running dry. The juice has been squeezed and there's very little left. Yeah. Okay, I get um, it. Yeah. That, that makes sense. So, so our goal is to- That's not because they they're, they lack dogs. They just lack quality well, dogs? what's oh. happening now is like- Here we go. Okay, yeah. let's listen. <laughs> so we'll take it back a little bit. To, to why we started this breeding program, where we've gotten with our dogs, right? Me and Ricky started this as a hobby when we were teenagers, right? We both had dogs from different backgrounds. We came from different backgrounds. We're training our dogs together. He had one background. I had another. We started training dogs. We started realizing, hey, this, this type of training worked for this type of dog and things like that, right? And we developed a specific type of dog that we saw, wow, that's a powerhouse. We can take this type of training and get that dog really dialed in, right? And we begin to develop a specific type of dog that we want. For police work. For police work. Mm -hmm. Majority of those dogs happen to come from Dutch bloodlines, from the Netherlands, from a sport called KMPV. It doesn't mean that every dog that comes from that sport is going to work for us, quite the contrary, but the ones that work out happen to come from that. Now in Holland, that's a hobby for those people, right? Those people have full-time jobs training KMPV, which, which in Dutch ref, roughly translates and is abbreviated for like the Royal Dutch Police Dog Training. It's, okay. a, it's a sport. Right? Okay. It's, a, it's a competitive sport. People take a puppy from eight weeks old. They raise it till the dog's usually about three years old. They do their police one, PH1. Competition. It's a competition. It's a trial. The dog gets scored. And their culture 
in that sport is once they do that title, they sell the dog. They get another puppy and they go again, right? And that's, uh, that's a hobby for these people. And that's been something that's been going for a long time. Okay. But what's happening, a lot of those guys that have been doing that for years, right? They've taken, they've titled 20 dogs. They're getting old. Some of them are dying or they just can't gotcha. handle the dogs so it's like, anymore. It's like the trades. Yeah, it's, a tra- it's essentially a trade, right? It's a hobby, but it is truly a trade. Okay. And, and that's that's dying out, right? The, I don't know what the membership is, but someone told me it's it's like a quarter. The KMPV membership is like a quarter now compared to what it used to be wow. like 10 years ago. And and the way, the reason those dogs work out pretty well, it's not necessarily because of the sport. It's more uh, a byproduct of how they train. It's a, little, a lot different than how we train, but it just so happens that the dogs that make it through that program tend to be pretty hard and pretty tough. They have a lot of drive. Uh, they test certain things in that sport that we need for police dogs, like hunting. Hunting is a huge one, and that's a sport that does test the dog's ability to hunt and search. So we've th- those dogs are just run and dry, right? And it's very hard to find them. You also have people from the U.S. that are into this as a sport and a hobby, mm-hmm. or as their personal, you know, it's what they're into. And they go over there and they'll hit up a guy and say, "Hey, I want that dog, and I'll pay X amount of dollars, sight unseen." And that person over in Holland is like, oh, great. This guy doesn't even know what he's looking at. Sure, I'll sell him that dog for that much. And there's- Which is way more than what a vendor more, would pay for. Way yeah. more, right? They just- well, How much are we it. talking? Uh, <sighs> like one of the famous stud dogs. We can't give out our trade secrets. Come no. on. <laughs> like for the person, for some idiot that goes over there and pays for something, that like what would they pay? 20, 20 plus. 20,000. 20, yeah. Plus. Plus. Okay. There's been, there's, it's not completely confirmed, but it's a pretty well-believed rumor that one of the top stud dogs over there sold to a person for $100,000. Right. And and that dog is very nice. He's an extremely nice dog. It's a lot of money. But that dog would be that dog would fit into our police dog program as like, yeah, that's another good one. Not gotcha. like, not like these are all of our police dogs, and that's the one that was worth a hundred thousand dollars. You would be like, Oh yeah, he's good. Yeah, he's good. It w- it's not a crazy standout. Excellent dog, but not a standout, right? And now you have me and Ricky going over there or hitting up those people saying, Hey, we're gonna pay X amount of dollars, but we need videos of this, videos of this, vi- all the And like, they're like, That's too much. Twenty work videos for me. of different yeah. things of the dog doing different things we're gonna test be- that we need to see. And they're like, nah, I got I got I got somebody I got who wants Joe to pay Blow twenty grand. Pay yeah. this, right? And Steve and I have our hands tied because <clears throat> industry stand because of the industry standard price and what the police departments are willing to pay compared to what they've paid in the past. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So is that so that's they're paying less. So those budgets are, are going in a different direction. No, the, they're not paying less, but they're so used to paying a certain amount that oh, they've paid you past can't. vendors for yeah. the, the existence of the program. You know what I'm saying? And we are we're not able. The police canine industry has not been able to match um, or even get close to the price that Joe Schmo is going to Europe and paying for dogs. You know what yeah. I'm saying? These people are over there. I'm sorry, Americans that have money and are doing this as a hobby and a sport can go over there and drop the way price. too much money mm-hmm. on a dog. And then we go over there. We have higher standards than them. And we can only pay so much because of what the police departments here are willing to pay due to industry standard. So now what happens is the Dutch people, rightfully so, are like, well, why are we going to sell them to these police canine guys that test the mm-hmm. shit out of our dogs and look are super picky when I can sell it to, you know, Whoever. the lady. And he's you know, going to be over the moon about my dog. He's right. not going to pick it apart. He's going to be like, oh, this is the best dog I've ever seen in my life. And then right. we're going to come Joe over and be is. like, we're going to be like, ah, yeah, you know, he's kind of a, this was okay. That was okay. But we'll buy him. In terms like, of the work, standards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And uh, so it, it's very hard in that in that aspect. I, I wonder how this I wonder how this fits in too, and that is you know, as this is happening, and you have these long lineages like of these bloodlines, mm-hmm. right? Um, specifically, like with agencies or departments that have they've always gotten these dogs from these from yeah. these breeders, right? And they're continuing to do this regardless of how those dogs are turning out, right? Maybe yeah. again going back to like this is a mediocre line anyways, but this is what we've established this contract. We have this relationship. They're not driving prices up on us. Yeah. We're, they're not getting caught up in this, again, this other uh, kind of uh, a business venture of selling to private private people or, right. or whatever. Has, how does that impact the, I guess, the the pool of dogs that these, these folks are getting? And, and maybe let me ask this a little bit of a different way. Like I know... <clears throat> I had some, I had a conversation with somebody that worked closely in the, at a high level, high, one of the top tier, tier one military units mm-hmm. who, you know, they were talking about the dog, the dog program. And yeah. basically they purchased basically the bloodline, if you will, like they get these dogs from this, these guys, mm-hmm. yeah. these, this particular breeder every year. They don't go and look for other dogs. Yeah. Like, is this just what we get? 
Yeah. Like that's what they get. Um, and so they're, there's not a, they're not comparing or contrasting to anything else. They're just taking what they take. Right. How does that impact like the, the, like a, like an apartment if they're in that kind of a situation. And I guess this would be like more maybe for like a bigger department, like, I don't know, an LAPD yeah. or something like that. Is this a thing? I, I think uh, tier one, like special forces type of stuff is a whole different ball game in a sense because okay. they have A, unlimited budgets for the most part and B, the ability to go travel to Europe and look at dogs themselves and yeah. do that sort of thing. Or even the ability to okay. go to any vendor in the US. That makes sense. Local yeah. police department here, well, we'll just talk about the Bay Area. Local police department here in the Bay Area, A, either already is contracted with a vendor, right? Or B, they've been going to X vendor for this many years. Yeah. They're going to stick with that vendor, right? Um, their hands are tied a little bit more, probably due to budget um, and due to it's history. The bureaucracy too, yeah. you know, it's just like this so, budgets and whatever. Yeah, like the, the whole special warfare thing. I don't, I, we don't train special warfare dogs, but I do know and talk to a lot of brokers that sell to them, right? They're, I think what they're probably saying when talking about bloodlines is not necessarily a specific line of dog, right? They're talking more about like a broker is typically what they're, they go to one broker. But you look at those brokers, and they have a kennel full of 100 dogs, right? So I'll, I'll hit up a guy overseas, right? Whatever his name is. And I'll say, hey, I need a dog. And I send him a bunch of videos of our testing, right? And I, I got a response from the guy. And he goes, oh, uh, those dogs are going to be a lot more. The, the videos you're doing is like our special forces testing, right? And this is what you're doing for your basic program. For our basic police dogs. And then the other problem that Ricky and I run into is a lot of police departments, they don't recognize the difference in dog quality. They think it's all training. That is like one of the, that's a whole topic we get into separately, but that's one of the biggest things that has separated me and Ricky is the dog training, selection. Yeah. The training is so important. The quality. That is everything, right? The, the dog has to be trained to perform, but you have to select a dog that is able to just be trained to do that job. The dog training industry, and this is where like the, the hobbyist, the sport and the police canine worlds kind of mix Right? The hobby and sport world is is great. And, that, and this police canine industry would not survive without them, right? Because that's where the dogs come from. Right. Yeah. But that whole industry is made on, hey, let's take this dog that has all these issues. And as a trainer, where's our skill level at where we can develop that dog into something that looks a lot better? For me and Ricky, we're looking They're masking. For yeah. They're masking problems in order to make them look better. And they can because they control so many variables. 100%, right? But our police canines, the, the variables are infinite, right? We have no idea what's going to happen. So for example, right, they have a dog that ha that's scared of slick floors, right? And, and whatever the case may be for their sport that they're doing, they want to get the dog over that. They can do a bunch of reps doing the same thing over and over to prepare the dog for a trial where it's going to see the same picture, right? Mm -hmm. And they can mm -hmm. get the dog over it where mm -hmm. they control the variables. They're gaming the drill. Yeah, yes. 100%. Well, well, for our police canines, what happens if the dog, we get the dog over slick floors, but all of a sudden now it's slick floors and there's like a, one of those construction job site fans on the floor blowing at the dog when it comes through. Now, you may have gotten him over that part, but that same genetic issue that dog has is going to unravel when you add another layer of stressor. stress to it, right? Mm -hmm. Another stressor to it. So, but these police departments, a lot of times don't see that. So we'll, Ricky and I will get a new contract, right? A new police department, and they'll have a dog that has nine failures or 10 failures or three failures or whatever, right? What's I mean, a failure? A failure means a dog was deployed on a search, a straight send on a person, whatever. The mm -hmm. dog was meant to be utilized and failed to engage on the person. Ran up to the person. It's a problem. Ran beside them. Uh went up to the guy curled up in the corner hiding after breaking into someone's house and sniffed him and then walked away. <laughs> Whatever you make so, right? That sounds... Or didn't even want to leave the handler's side yeah. because it was asleep in the back of the car, right? Yeah. And, and it sounds laughable, but like these are serious. Like this is like common issues we run into with new agencies all the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And but, that comes from dog selection primarily. And, and I think the biggest thing, and Steve and I do our best to educate people as much as we can. If... Admin was watching this right now and was to take one thing from this, it would be you're not buying four Glock 17s. They're you know, not all the same. They're not all the same. Not at all. You're not buying really gear. You are, yes, you are buying a tool. The police canine is a tool, but it's so much more complex than the way they look at no, it. That makes, it's not a machine. It's not a machine. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not something that you can send. It's not a Glock 17 that you can send to the gunsmith and it's going to get fixed and come out perfectly shining, yeah. ready to go. It is a living, breathing animal that- With a nervous system. Its own right? desires. Yeah. With its own desires, mm -hmm. its own thought processes. Its own fears. Its mm -hmm. own fears. All these different things that we have to take into accountability or take into account when we are testing dogs. Yeah. <sighs> So in terms of like the selection process, so you just mentioned like one way would be to 
go overseas or test dogs, go overseas, test them again, you know, see some video and then mm -hmm. go test them or see some tests on video and then basically make a commitment on buying this dog. Yeah, so and have here that, we go. Have that dog yeah. shipped out here and you hope based oh on what you God, just said, yeah. they just didn't game the video, <laughs> right? They didn't game the video on yeah. some of these drills. Uh, I want to talk about that. Yeah. And then the other part would be is like, okay, once we found the dogs, right, in terms of the selection process, then we select from a breeding perspective. Now we control this process. 100%. And then we can, we can start to select the best from those litters to do the things that we need them to do for the job that we need them to do. Because you might have, I don't know, eight dogs in a litter, right? Three of them, you're like, these are perfect for this type of work. Yes. Not good for this type of work. Right. Or, but three of those other dogs are good for this other type of work or whatever. So now you, you have control over the process. Yep. You're also 1000% accountable to this. <laughs> like you can't, like if you, if you've said, no, we bred the dog for this and you we're going to also train your dog or we're selling the dog to yep. you. Like people can come direct to you. I don't imagine that hat. There's a lot of accountability over in Europe. If I've gone over there no. and I've gotten a dog. Zero. So let's talk, let's talk about that. Try suing somebody in, in Europe that sent you uh, the dog that they didn't promise that they were going to send to you. This happens? It, it, good luck. I don't know if that's <laughs> ever happened. But it, we buy the dog, it's ours, right? But the, the gaming of the videos like you talked about, this is something me and Ricky have really become like, like, dude, it's, it's funny. Like Steve and I are traumatized to, to take 101 up to San Francisco yeah. airport because of how many times we've gone there. I don't get, exci all I don't get excited, excited when dogs come in, dude. It, there's no more excitement, but I'm telling you for years, we would go so excited and we're, yeah, we're going to pick up this dog. It looks so badass in video. We get there and we just immediately just look at each other and okay. just like, oh. So this qualifies as a oh, yeah. um, comment earlier about uh, Steve getting anxiety on his way to the airport to test oh, dogs. I see a I, dog coming out of a crate. It's just yeah. beautiful. So, okay. So talk about this process for those people that don't don't know or, or don't understand. <clears throat> you already talked about, okay, so I've seen a dog. I see some videos. You ask them to send you videos back. You're going, okay, I, I'm going to have that dog shipped out there. They don't just ship it out on lease and go, if you don't like them, send them back. Right? Very rarely. Sometimes so, right? some people are that they're okay. building relationships with, like new, that really want to sell uh, this dog. Sometimes, okay. but that's very, very rare. So, Extremely rare. So you're buying a dog site unseen mm, absolutely. minus the yeah. video. And I think like the biggest thing that people, a big thing in the industry is to let dogs come over from Europe after you've watched all this video and you purchase the dog, it gets over here and people love to give the dog time and give the dog time to adjust, give the dog time to, what, what other word do they use? Acclimate. Acclimate. There uh, you go. All these sort of things, right? Jet lag. And, yes. Just, and Steve and I have always <laughs> been super um, adamant about one thing and that's we pretty much know within five minutes of taking that dog out of the car if it's going to, or out of the crate that it came in under the plane we know if it's going to work or not. We know if it's going to, we know if we're going to deselect it. Okay. So, all right. So let just slow down here. For a <laughs> so I'm, I'm, let's just say I'm in the, I'm in the passenger seat on the way to the airport. The where's, what does this look like? So do you go to like the cargo section of cargo the airport? Of the like airport. So we're at SF yep. San Francisco international. We go to the cargo section. Yep. They have, what do they do? They pull the dogs off the crate and put them in a certain area no, for the you. Dogs so they make you wait. Pallet. They make you wait an extended period of time for no reason while the dog's sitting right there in the crate and you can hear it barking and scratching. <laughs> like, we'll go there. Like right? right there. Okay, yeah. so the dog's been on the airplane for 12, 13 12 hours. 12 or 13 yeah. hours. Right? Then a, a really um, rude and, you know, like disrespectful <laughs> and CSA agent or something. upset person, you know, calls you next and you go up and you're like, oh, here we go. What's the problem like the this DMV? time? Yeah. yeah. It's like, what's the problem, problem this time? Did, did, oh, you didn't get this signed. Oh, you need to go to Homeland Security and get this signed. Uh, oh, you, uh, um, your broker hasn't contacted us yet. It always end up being wrong. It uh, ends up being fine. We have everything, but they always say there's something Oh yeah. Wrong. We've accepted, it depends on who you talk to. We've accepted <laughs> cards for five years, but as of today, cash only, right? Like it's just, <laughs> it's, it's always something, right? Okay. Never um, smooth. Never. Right. And so eventually <laughs> somehow you get your paperwork all good to go. Your rubber stamp. Yep. They yeah. tell you, okay, go pick up the dog. So you walk around to the, the cargo entrance and you give them your paperwork and they bring the dog to you. And then, you yeah, know, we're like on a, like on a pallet or yeah, something. On a pallet. Yeah. yeah. yeah on like a, a pallet jack. Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes, like at Home Depot. Like, sometimes double stacked with other dogs. Mm -hmm. right? Like it's okay. a pallet, like a dog. Crate. It's usually funny. Cause you know, we're there picking up this police canine and someone, that's locating, <laughs> that's relocating here to work for Facebook or Apple is, you know, with their little doodle and they're all like, oh, hello. 
it was it doing? And we're and you're all, about and we to got this dog just like spinning in the crate, yeah. and mad, uh, <laughs> or sometimes okay. terrified. Yeah, unfortunately. And yeah. then okay, and then we take the leap of faith, right? So we open it's this like, crate. Yeah, it's like, is it like does that doorway like five thousand pounds? You're just like. You start to slowly open it. It weighs a lot of fuck. money. Oh, oh God. God. Here we go. <laughs> we what's about to happen? Yeah. We open this door. We leash the dog up. And immediately, within like five seconds, we either look at each other and smile or we look at each other and be <laughs> like, oh, God. Fuck. That was a $10,000 yeah. mistake. Yeah. yeah. You you can like, you can tell the dog, the way like, the way the dog comes out of the crate is the first thing we look at, right? Like if that dog comes out of the crate, like you open the, you go to open the door and he's like trying to bust his head out of there. You got to like catch him by the collar, leash him on. And he's just off to the races, dragging you everywhere. That's like, that's a okay, good sign. Confidence. Like this dog is his own man. He okay. just wants to rip off and go do his thing. And so, you know, people in this industry <clears throat> tell me and Steve, like, well, it shouldn't matter how the dog comes out within the first couple minutes. They just, they just moved to America. They, they're getting off the plane in a okay, new country. Okay, hold on, stop it. Just time out for a second because I have, I have other questions. Like, the, while I believe that to be very true, um, just real quick, like the dog's been on the plane for 15 hours or yes. whatever, right? Yeah. His dog shit himself and pissed all over the crate or whatever? A lot not, of times not. There's bedding in there. They usually have some sort of bedding or like um, blankets or something for the dog to, something okay. to soak up if the dog were to slow himself. But honestly, these adult dogs, pretty clean, dude. They're pretty clean. I can't remember the last dog I picked up that had any sort of excrement in the crate. Okay. Sometimes pissed, but like it, normally the dogs are not shit. Have themselves. they eaten? Uh, uh, depends. If there was a connecting flight, usually they'll feed them at the kennel at the airport on that connecting flight. But we try our best to get dogs here on direct flights just to just simplify to, everything. To make that dog better. breaks out of the crate on the tarmac. Like that's happened to people. So right? are these dogs food driven? Like when you get there or you don't want to see anything like that? Uh, They can be. I'm, yeah. This is just curious because you know some people that's all the, that's the only thing they can do to get their dog to do what they want them to do. If they right. want their dog to sit unless they've got food in their hand, that dog ain't doing shit. Yeah, we're not so worried about like the training at this point. No. We're just worried about the okay. raw genetic quality of the animal. All right, yeah. so you mentioned like you got to kind of open the door a little ways because it might take two of you to wrangle this dog together and get, nah, the, get, the, get, the, get the leash on it. Essentially, right? yeah. So it's, it's pulling you around. What else is a good sign? So um, let me just, I'll put this out there first. Imagine like the pol type of police dog we want before it's trained is like a nightmare to, to deal with. Not in the, For the not, average person. Not like the not Tasmanian devil. Yeah, not, and it's not because the dog's a nutcase. It's not because he's trying to kill everybody. It's not because of any of that. It's because this dog, if, if I brought him in here and I like tapped on this table like that, he's going to jump on here for the hell of it because he can scramble around just like a bull in a china shop. Okay. Reckless. Think of like super robust. Just the dog is just, he comes in, you're like, whoa. <laughs> like a that's savage. A and the that's reason, a like, like, a, like, like a savage from the from the jungle. And the oh. reason why that's so important to okay. us is because when it's three a.m. in the morning, and one of our handlers gets a call to mm -hmm. a you know building that has been broken into, and they show up, we don't know what the dog is going to encounter, and we don't want to be worried about whether or not the dog is going to find something scary or find something um, as a stressor. So for us, it's super important to have that level of drive, that level of confidence. Okay. Not drive, but confidence. Okay. Because, That's not drive yet. Right. Because for us, it doesn't matter how much drive in the world a dog has. If the confidence is not there to match, it's there's a much higher probability that the dog is going to have some sort of failure on the street because it viewed something as a stressor. So the reason why it's so important for us, that it's so important to us for the dog to come out of the car, I mean, sorry, come out of the crate at the airport hot and ready to go, willing to jump on anything, friendly, all that sort of stuff, is because that, if the dog can go through that flight and, and have no problems, which honestly isn't that really that bad. The dog's under a plane. It's probably some sort of vibrating noise. And the dog really is just taking a nap the whole time in the crate, right? But for us, if the dog can come out and perform right out of the crate, it's already a super nice sign to us that we're not going to... that. As of now, the dog isn't deselected yet. You know gotcha. what I'm saying? Yep. Um, and that for us is super important. That's why that coming out of the crate piece is really is so such a big thing for Steve and I because it gives us already a, a little insight into what this dog is looking like so far. So so what's next? I mean, does much more happen at the airport? Or is this like so the smile has happened, right? Right. And you're just going, <laughs> hopefully, oh, hopefully, thank God. Hopefully. Do, you, do you throw them back in there and go, okay, let's let's get to the next part of the testing or is there more stuff? So we always go to the bathroom. Yeah, we let them go yeah. to the bathroom. We cross the street. <laughs> go back to what I asked before, yeah. Most of the time, these, these uh, dogs are coming in to like Delta 
um, the Delta Cargo. That's yeah. pretty much where we've been picking up most, most of the time. dogs. That or KLM. Yeah. Like Dutch Airlines. Right across the street, there's, I don't know what business or what airport building it is, but they have a pile of junk. And we always run over to that pile of junk and right away try to see if the dogs are hopping on top of that pile of junk or not. It's kind of like become a thing. We do yeah, it, it with happens. every single dog. Oh, interesting. So yeah. like just go climbing around. Yeah. yeah. Just be curious. Yeah. So we, we literally get out of the cargo at, like entrance or the cargo, you know, building. We just walk to the bushes and the rocks, let the dog do its thing. It's got to go potty because it's been locked up for mm -hmm. a while. And we just cross the street and start right away testing environmentals and testing the dog's confidence. That's not like our official test. This is more just like, hey, let's let's just see what he does, right? I, I'm getting that, yeah. Because yeah. at some level, then there has to be a little bit more detail to 100%. this. We have a process. But you're, yeah, and you're giving us that, like, because if, it, if they don't pass that first part, then you already know, like, yep. I'm not... I, I need to move on. Like, yeah. I'm, I, maybe I'm yeah. just moving on or maybe it's like, okay, we'll give, if you don't pass the first three things and we don't go on, we don't move on to four. Right. There's levels to it, gotcha. right? Like Everything's it, got levels. There, there's things that if a dog is lacking it a little bit and and that's very subjective because a lot of people, what, what we would consider lacking a little bit, they'd say, oh, that's bulletproof, man, right? Or, or whatever else. A dog lacking in one area a little bit could be compensated by something else. But for the most part, we try not to make excuses at all at first, right? Like it, it, the, a dog failing stuff, that's a washout. And then, okay, let's, maybe we'll see how, how everything else looks. Right? Gotcha. We, we take them across and we want to see that confidence. And like he was saying earlier, it's not drive, right? And we specifically do not induce the dog's drive when we're testing that. We try to keep them calm. Okay, so let's define drive then because maybe I'm confused on what that is. So like, drive is traditionally what called prey drive. We just call it drive because we talk okay. about it so much. So we're talking about prey, prey drive. drive. Got it. Um, and I'm not talking about the prey drive in your grandpa's hunting dog when it sees a squirrel run by and it chases it down or, you know, a, a Labrador, um, you know, kind of chasing ducks up in the sky. Um, that, that is prey drive, but it's its own sort of thing for police canines. And we'll keep it to that for this to make it simpler. Prey drive is the dog's want to chase something that is moving. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's for us, it's important that 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 object is an innate object, right? Something that nor a, a normal everyday dog would find no interest in, right? Um, so it's a leather rag like we did with the puppy or it's... Um, Can. A, you know, a, anything. Okay. Literally, we could take a bottle and move it. We want to see that dog immediately ignite and be be like, I want to grab what that. I want that? to possess that. Right. Not what is it, but I want it. Okay. Does that make sense? With no hesitation. Well, that's way, way different than what is it. And like the reason way why that, different. yeah, way, way different. different. And the it's, reason why that's so important to us is because eventually through training, what we do is we turn humans into a prey item, right? And we can go down the rabbit hole with, you know, what we look for in our adult dogs too, but we are looking for uh, a dog that with very little work will be able to uh, view a person, view a human as a item to go into prey for um, when the triggers right. go. Occur. Does that make sense? Yep. When the triggers occur. And that's the training. That's through training, yes. in a mm -hmm. sense. But we have to have that raw genetic want and desire to do anything. Yeah, I hear what you're doing. I, I hear what you're doing there. There's some very specific keywords and how you're separating things out that make making a lot of sense to me. It would be the same as like selecting an athlete for a certain thing. Or, 100%. You're know, going back to the special warfare things, yeah. but selecting those. You can you can be the best athlete in the room. There's going to be 10 other fucking right. great athletes, right? Yeah. Like you can be a really good shooter. Well, there's nine other guys that are really good shooters, right? Or you can be, you know, the the strongest guy. Well, there's six other guys that are stronger than you. Yep. As you start getting down to the thing, there are some very, very specific things outside of what you would consider for, you know, as the ultimate athlete or right. whatever it is, yeah. dog, that the they either have or they don't, mm -hmm. right? And you have to decide, like, how much time do I or don't I put into this to decide, like, is this a viable candidate still or are we done? Right. Yeah. Um, okay. I think I get this. There's, so, there's other drives we're not going to talk about those, but there's other drives that we can utilize in a dog to get them to perform. And we, that, that's our job as a trainer. If we get a lesser dog that a department already has, there's other drives we can use and ways we can train and, and certain things to get a dog to perform. For what we select for, it's prey and it's extreme prey mm -hmm. over the top, right? Something I take a, a can like this and I go, and I give it the slightest little bit of animation 
I drop it on the floor very passively and that dog just like erupts, like sprawled out. If I let him go onto it, onto the concrete, he's going to like break his teeth, right? Like with some of these dogs, when you, you show them something like that on the ground, just, just for the hell of it, see if he's going to bite it, want to bite it on the ground. You have to like slowly lower them to the ground. And then they like smash into it and then they like wrap it. They start like possessing, possessing it. Possessing it, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're looking for, right? It's important to differentiate that between just prey drive because a lot of dogs, Malinois have prey drive, but they do not, most do not have it to this extreme level that would meet our selection criteria that we have success with in our police dogs. So let's wrap this back into the breeding program and yeah. how this all ties in, yeah. you know, because you've gotten dogs from other places. Again, we talked about sort of your, your path here and how long you guys have been doing this and you've been able to select certain dogs for certain things. You've had a lot of success. So ultimately you put a couple dogs together that, that display these different characteristics. I mean, this is animal breeding 101, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. animal husbandry 101. I actually had to take that in college at one point. Like there's, <laughs> yeah. there are things that you do, right? Yeah. Um, anybody that's been involved that will know. So you start to put these things together and then, then you, but you kind of get what you get, right? Like it's a, it's a roll of the dice. It's a roll of the every dice. time, every time, all, all of the time. So talk to, talk to us about the breeding program, like how that works for you guys, just maybe at a, at a higher level without, I mean, I know how puppies are made. You don't have to tell me how that happens. <laughs> yeah. We actually but, don't do it the natural way. We have a different way of doing it. But it's, that's it's all secret. Thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, we, the, yeah. We ain't going there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've seen some videos. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, we don't have to talk about that. But, uh, <laughs> but the, um, the, in terms of the breeding program, like how does that work? How long does it take to start to feel really confident about the dogs that are in your program? That, that's a great question because that's just something that Steve and I have actually been chatting about a lot recently as we're uh, putting a new litter on the ground. So a police canine from a puppy, uh, at eight weeks, we already are, before eight weeks, probably five or six weeks, we're already weeding dogs out, right? Okay. So, and, and Steve can talk a little bit more because he just went through this experience of actually weeding out his own litter of puppies that he raised in his living room. I mean, we literally, Steve and I watched these puppies come out of the womb mm -hmm. and take their first first breath in the living room. Um, now, 10 weeks later, we already can see who is showing great potential and who's probably not cutting it, right? So Steve is keeping back a couple puppies from this litter, five to be exact, um, that are showing great potential. But even with, with them showing all the potential in the world doesn't, right now... Doesn't mean they're going to be... Doesn't mean no. anything. So probably somewhere from the... I don't know, what do you want to say? 13 to 24 month range, they're going to be uh, actually being selected as police dogs. Yeah. But in between now and then, they are going, every time we pull them out of the crate, they are being tested. And if we see something that is a red flag, you're out. <laughs> and it's not because we don't have the patience to, to work with these dogs. It's not because uh, we're not, uh, we don't want to problem solve. It's because Steve and I refuse to go to sleep at night knowing that we put something on the street with a canine handler that is not going, That had a question mark. That had a question mark. Yeah. Absolutely refuse. Um, I don't care how much money in the world you're paying me for this dog. I will not do it. We will not do it. And that's been what's held us to this standard and to this quality the entire time that we've been training police dogs. What's the reality of this in the industry at large? So... The, the, this is why we're so picky with our puppies because what you'll see a lot of times is people do all this selection and stuff and they're really picky about their dogs, but all of a sudden they do a litter of puppies and all of a sudden the narrative changes. Oh man, well, you know, the puppy, he's only been out of the house four times. Oh, you're going back to that coddling it kind of thing. Well, you know, just, we call it kennel blindness. Kennel blindness is a term you use. Kennel blindness means you're hypercritical of everything else, but whatever comes from your crop, your breedings, you're like, oh, well, you know, that, well, he didn't, he, just because he was sick, man, like he, he didn't look so good today because he's sick. He was but, really good last week. Yeah. And so, and again, like, so this last litter that we had, it was uh, Koa, mm -hmm. which is one of our police dogs, and my wife's dog, Cora, right? Cora is a pretty special dog in her own way. She competes with her. She does PSA, Protection Sports Association, the same sport that Ricky does with Icon. Icon, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, does really well with the dog. The dog has some characteristics that we really like to see in our police dogs. That's why we chose her for breeding. Uh, well, we can go back to the, the testing at some point because we really didn't get into the whole process and that's important to know when we're talking okay. about the police dogs. But I'll just touch on it. We can define what those things are later. The dog has extreme environmental 
confidence, which is what we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. If I bring that dog into, into here and ask her to jump on anything with no, no ball, no food, no reason other than just she don't, wants to do it for the hell of it, the dog is climbing, going everywhere. Really important for a police dog. Reckless. That's the reckless, word we like to use. And right? that dog is the definition of reckless. And hunt. The dog has extreme hunt. I will put her her hunt, so meaning I, I throw a ball into a field or I throw a ball into a or high building or, or hide it. And the dog's desire to search, but also the sense of urgency with which that dog searches, right? We think about, it's not a matter of people say like, oh, the dog has a good nose. I don't really care how good the dog's nose is, meaning how fast the dog finds it. I want to see when that dog knows there's something to be found that is a prey drive item, like a ball, right? That stimulates the dog's prey drive. That dog looks like a printer going super fast, zigzagging in that Mm -hmm. room, trying to find it, just frantic. Sometimes the dogs even vocalize while they're doing it because they're so frantic to find that thing. And that hunt is super important. Every dog has a good nose. Go to the park and look at people's dogs. (laughs) The nose is on the ground the whole time. Right. Right. The phrase that we like to use for the extreme hunt is hair on fire. When you think Mm -hmm. like, Hair on fire, fire that is what we're looking ass. for. Yeah. <laughs> fire crack up the ass, right. what you want to see. Let's go. So there's that. Constant. Right. Yeah. That's that's what she brings to the table. And so, duration with it too, yes. right? It's, it's not just a like, spurt. It's, it's not out of gate. It's like indefinite. endurance for this. Yeah. And I'm talking about like 20, 30, 40, even more minutes of- Of that frantic. Of that constant franticness and it not petering. It's constant. Okay, I get you. Yeah. You're just red Even lining. if the dog is exhausted, you can still tell that dog is has not forgotten and the sense of urgency has not gone away. The dog's just exhausted. You can see a difference between that and a dog just fizzling out in this hunt. And the reason why that's so important is because the number one thing our police canines are used for is as a searching tool, right? Mm-hmm. Here in the Bay Area, a normal block has a lot of houses, right? It's depending on, every city's different, right? Mm-hmm. But a, your average block has enough houses that it's going to take hours for a police canine team to search. And methodically. Methodically, right? Because we're not just letting right. the dog go into a yard and saying, hey, good luck. Come out now. You're going to get bit. Woo! Gone, right? right? There's a lot that goes into it. So it's really important that these dogs have and continue to have the want to search for hours on end for hope to hopefully find a criminal, right? It's not... We're, we didn't... Our... our entire testing process and what we're looking for in dogs is made to fit what we think, what we know um, is needed as a police canine here in the Bay Area. Gotcha. Yeah. So it could be, okay, I got you. Just from like maybe even if you're working out in very, very rural areas or whatever, it may be different. Yeah. Because you might not have have different needs. You might not. Yeah. Different needs. You might not have to go search a backyard and then come out and stop for five minutes and plan the next search or contact the responsible of the next home. Right. I never never gave that any consideration. Start, stop, start, stop. And even within the search, we start, we kick the dog off. And remember we talked last time about the side yard and the dog checking the trash cans. The trash cans. Right. Uh, it's not just cutting the dog off leash and dog goes to the other side, to, to the backyard and then to the other side of the house. Stops it's, at every stop along the way. It's go stop, right? Come here and search this a little bit more. Search this a little bit more. Okay, go on. Stop. Team, let's move up. Team moves up. Search. Hey, uh, Handler, he didn't search those bushes right there. Can you put him in there? Yes, TL. We can put the dog back there. Call the dog back. Put him in there. Does that make sense? So yeah. it's a constant... Go stop, go stop, go stop, go stop. And if you don't have a dog with that extreme hunt like Cora does, good luck. Gotcha. The dog gotcha. fizzles a lot, right? So there's Cora and then there's Koa. Anyways, excellent, outstanding, all around police dog. Yeah, he's the unicorn. Unicorn, right? Also, just how that a dog of that level that was also that easy to train is pretty rare. So, anyways, long story short, we did the breeding. The puppies are 10 weeks old now, right? The things that we're looking for at this age are environmental confidence and drive. Environmental confidence means I take this puppy into a new place like your gym and the puppy's cruising around, tail up, wants she to say hi to everybody, wants yeah. to jump on anything, all that, right? She was great today. Yeah, yeah. that and then uh, the prey drive. Prey drive is I, I show the dog something, whatever it is, the rag that we use for bite work or my keys or a stick on the ground, whatever. I stim it up a little bit, meaning stim means I just make a little bit of movement to it and someone's holding the puppy back and she sees that and it draws her attention and she lights off. Instant flammability. Right, we want to see Hair that. on fire. Hair, Hair on, on fire. fire. Mm-hmm. Um, and so far from that breeding, and, th- and this is again, they're 10 weeks old, right? We've seen dogs. I-, I haven't seen too many dogs start out at, let's say like a level seven, right? And then, or level 10, it's a, it's a 10 out of 10 puppy. Have- we haven't seen too many of those ones turn into a two, right? But we have seen dogs that were like a seven turn into a 10 and dogs that were a 10 turn into a seven. So, okay. you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like 
A freak puppy that's just over the top. Oh my God, this thing's incredible. I haven't really seen too many of those fizzle out, but we see a little bit of variance as they mature. So time will tell with these puppies. But as of now, the things we're looking for are a very workable drive, which is good, and environmental confidence. Those are our two main things. As they get older, we'll continue to, we're obviously training them, right? We're not just testing the puppy every single day. What Ricky's saying when he says we're testing them is, as we're working them it's into an developing assessment. them, yes, it's an assessment, an assessment right? Yeah. We're, we're working this puppy and we're building it up because it is a puppy. It needs training. It needs to be developed properly. Mm -hmm. But as that's happening, we're constantly taking mental notes. Or even now, we actually really want to take physical notes. Right. Right? We want to have like Well, you a got ledger. a lot of puppies running around. Yeah. There's been a yeah. couple litters, right? So <laughs> we have the female that I kept, which hopefully will be my, my female for PSA. And then I kept uh, four of her brothers. Two of them look like freaks. Two of them are looking pretty good. We'll see. And I just, it, the thing is when we have this breeding ourselves, we have the time, we have the space to keep them around and see what happens, right? Mm -hmm. And we can, it, it, we, they didn't cost us anything other than just our time. Right. So let's keep the ones that are the maybes because sometimes those do develop really well, mm -hmm. right? And so we're kind of trying to keep more around because the whole point is just to supplement the importing of dogs. And right now, like we're behind. And, and one thing that I do want to mention <laughs> is we've been blessed to be surrounded by people and police departments that are willing to partake in this breeding program with us. One of the, I mean, I may have talked about this last time, but one of the biggest things that plagues the police canine industry and plagues like these bloodlines and stuff is the fact that the best dogs come to the U.S. and either go into the military, go into a police department, and then are never, ever never seen, seen in the again. gene pool ever again. No, we didn't talk about this. We were talking about it out front though for a little bit. Like it, like that, that great dog just kind of goes away. It right. gets used. Right. But it never, it doesn't live on. Yeah, and yeah. we've been bl yeah. absolutely blessed that the the administration and the chief at the police department um, that Co is at has not only allowed us but encouraged us um, and been supportive of our breeding program. The, the the fact that he's honoring how important he sees that the vision, is. man. Yeah, he's, he he's, they, he's honoring. They that. see the vision, and that is awesome to us. And that if it wasn't for that, honestly. I don't know where we would be at with our breeding program. So that is something that I do want to mention and something that has really been able, has really allowed us to skyrocket this program to where it is today because Koa is that unicorn for us. He is that freak of nature. You know what I'm saying? I always joke and, and say that uh, Steve's going to get Koa's ID number tattooed on him uh, <laughs> because of how much we talk about the dog, but it's hard not to. You've yeah, seen the dog. I've seen I mean, him. He's, a freak. He's, a, he's a freak. He's an yeah. absolute, like, impressive. I, 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 I didn't freak. have much to compare him to except for the other dogs that were there that one day. Like, just my, I was just sort of kind of discovering yeah. all this. But since then, now looking and seeing lots of other dogs, like he is the comparison. Right. It's totally. like it's like your favorite restaurant, right? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. or uh, I'll just I'll just put it this way: like you had that that best girlfriend you ever had, right? And then she's so <laughs> every girlfriend after that gets compared. Right? Oh, like, oh, she's married. It's so bad. Yeah. Well, so basically, so am I. So <laughs> the point of, the point of this is is like there's a there's a there is a litmus, right? Unless you know, you don't know. Right. So if you're just getting these dogs, if you're in this program and you think this is the best there ever was, but you never get exposed to anything else, that's a problem. Yeah. Because totally. then you're working with fives. Yeah. Right. You're, t you're working with fives instead of tens, you know, and you don't, if you've never seen a 10 and you don't know what a 10 looks like yeah. or, or what a 10 is capable of, like that, then you're every officer, every particular call is dealing in this five range they rather than the norm. Right. And, and it's the norm. It's funny you say that because Steve and I, do you get a lot of shit for our litmus test and, and what surrounds it? But at the end of the day, the brain can only see what the brain knows. And that's super huge, right? For us. Like I always tell Steve, we always have this conversation. It's like literally what you just said. They don't know what they don't know. <laughs> there's a, there's a backside to this too, is like, if you've been in a bad relationship forever and you don't know what a good relationship looks like, that's the whole other side of this. Absolutely. Like totally. until you get that good one and you sit and you're like, Holy God. Yeah. Like I had no idea. Like it could, I never want to go back to yeah. that other thing. Yeah. So no doubt. yeah. In terms of like your, um, <clears throat> you know, where this thing is going and you guys have been very, very busy. You know, when I, when I watch what's sort of happening with you and when I talk to you, I mean, uh, a lot of contact with you guys just, you know, intermittently throughout the, the weeks and months. Um, What's the, I mean, obviously it sounds like you guys are very excited about this breeding program. Uh, what else has got you guys really fired up right now? Like what's, what's going on out there in spectrum canine world or dog world or whatever. That's, 
that's got you. Can you talk about stuff? Or? Yeah, I mean, um, I we've been super, secrets, super but. busy recently, and uh, it, we're getting so busy. It's to the point now where Steve and I have always done everything together. All we've always done our police canine training together, always. And we're getting to the point now where it's like, oh, dude, we got to split up today. Like, you got to go to this department, I got to go to this department. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have patrol school coming up. We just wrapped one up, and we got another one coming up uh, in about a month here. <clears throat> and uh, patrol school is basically our. Our, our basic handler course, it's where we take new handlers okay. or even experienced handlers with new dogs and put them together. We do all the training and we do all, all we do all the selection, the sale to the department of the dog and the training for both the dog and the officer. And uh, like some full service shit. Yeah. Eight weeks long, it's 40 a, hours a week. It's an eight week long course. It's a lot on Steve and I <laughs> because we're basically taking a team from nothing to the day they leave our class, they might have to go do a full search for the with the SWAT team for a murder suspect, right? And that's something, another thing that we've been doing a lot is we've been traveling quite a bit. I went and did a, a police canine seminar in Georgia for Georgia Police Canine Foundation. And then I also went and did cool. a couple uh, seminar and workshops for um, some departments in Florida. ATF SRT was there, um, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. So some some pretty you know, big names in the industry. Um, and we're really just like trying to, trying to stay afloat. You know what I mean? We, we've been blessed uh, that our quality and our standard is getting out there. Um, and it's just like department after department calling us every week being like, Hey, we heard what you got. We want that. And it's, it's been really cool and it's really paying off, especially um, because like you said earlier, there's a lot of stuff that kind of, you know, held us back early on. We're young. We're not cops. We have this really hard testing process. All these things that held us back, people are completely looking past now because we've been able to hold our standards high. Yeah, it's working out really well. And, and that's why the breeding program is so important for us is because this demand for dogs is becoming high. And the breeding program is, is an experiment. And demand for excellent dogs. Right, right. For excellent dogs, right? People see the dogs that we have on the street like we want that. We're like, well, those don't grow on trees, man. Like those are really, really hard to find. Right. Now, this is not to say that this breeding program is going to uh, produce those consistently, right? But it's it's another attempt at finding those dogs because we could have the two best. I've, and I, growing up as a little kid, right, I I was all excited to get different puppies from these breedings. That hey, this dog was a phenomenal producer. Right. It's a champion. All this stuff. The mom's a great producer. They're breeding together. Should be great, right? And I was on a wait list. All this stuff, and I got the puppy. And I was like, I don't know, I was like 14 years old and I was driving home with this thing in my dad's truck. And I, I had a, another puppy for a, a friend that was an older guy that also knew the breeder. And I was holding them both. Mine was like out cold in my arms. And the other one was watching cars go by on the highway going into prey. And I was just like, damn it. Like, I, got the, <laughs> I, got the, I got the lemon. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and that's just, that's, that's the nature of breeding and dogs, right? If, yeah. if, if it was this easy to breed them, if the breeding program was able to be that successful, everyone would be breeding these sure. dogs, right? Sure. So it's not that we're going to like take this breeding program and it's going to be a sole source thing. It's just that, Hey, we've, we've worked really hard, me and Ricky to find some really strong dogs over the years. We've honed our selection test and we've got something we think is finally worth breeding, right? A lot of people jump into their breeding fast. They get their first dog that's a five. They've had a bunch of twos. They get a five. And they're like, oh, we got to breed this thing. Me and Ricky never did that, right? We got a couple dogs. Hey, that was nice. What, what can we find better? That one. Oh, that one's even better. Oh, that one's even better. And we finally have seen enough dogs. Like, that thing is really worth breeding. Let's see. And it just so happened this dog produced well or has produced so mm. far, right? Yeah. On top of the breeding program, which really, as you can tell, has been taking up a lot of our time recently. Uh, we're starting that basic handler course. So that's coming around. We're trying to find dogs. Sadly, breeding program. It's an investment in the future. It's not there yet. Um, so we're working really hard right now to find dogs for our, the departments that are going through our course. And that's been keeping, especially Steve, super busy contacting all the people that we know in Europe and trying to find Get, dogs that fit our standard, hopefully mm -hmm. over video, going to San Francisco, yeah. picking them up, seeing how they are. I was on the beach in Aruba on my honeymoon hitting up this guy. This dog came available that I've been trying to get. And I was like, all right, I need that thing here. As soon as I get back, so I'm on the beach, like, you know, getting tacos. This is the life of an entrepreneur. You know, come back and I'm all, works, all right, man. how many pounds, man? Yeah. Hey, hey, mate, uh, send this many pounds. I'm like, all right, cool, boom, done. <laughs> hey, bruv. Hey, bruv. Hey, bruv. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's rad. Again, two really nice dogs from that guy. So I'm stoked on those. I love it. Yeah. yeah. And that then uh, on top of all the police canine stuff, that's not even talking about our competition stuff that we're doing. 
and our pet dogs. I mean, Steve and I still train a bunch of pet dogs. Um, and really, we, the pet dogs is just supplementing our crazy obsession over police canine stuff. I, I mean, it's it's impressive. Uh, you know, the 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 amount of work that you guys have, have gotten done, and I've seen it, like I said, skyrocket. the The selection process really intrigues me. Um, obviously, the training process is a whole other thing, uh, but it starts there. And you know, we've talked about it. This this helps me sort of get a much better understanding. And probably a lot of people out there listening to this about where the breakdowns can happen. And there there may be handlers out there listening to this going. Oh fuck! Mm-hmm. Like I've totally, I've got this dog who's a few years old, and this is the first time I'm hearing a lot of this. Yeah. Or I actually like intuitively sort of knew my dog had a deficiency, but now they're saying some things that I'm like, I've seen this happen. Go back to the slick floors, yeah. Yeah. that industrial fan, you know, kind of thing. I, is there a way out of this for, for for folks like that? And more importantly, like what does this mean in terms of breakdowns and the things that we see on the street? Um, through like body cam footage and things like that, that can create program problems for people. Um, can, can, you know, can you, can you work your way out of that? And, or are there things that they, that people could be watching or gaining from this videos or whatever to go, the reason that guy or that cop, sorry, that dog did this or didn't do this could have been discovered or likely could have been discovered in this part in the process. I mean, uh, do you guys sit there and watch videos totally. and go and just go every day? <laughs> I know for you, because <laughs> anytime I see stuff that whether it looks good or looks bad, I always send it to you. Like I don't send you everything because there's a lot of shit out there. But if I'll you see, look at our Instagram DMs, it's like body cam footage to body cam footage back and forth. People are just sending everybody that stuff back yeah. and forth. And, and you know, I, I, those are obviously very, very specific incidents. They're very real life. They have, uh, they're, they're individual. No two incidents, incidents are the same that we were talking about, but yeah, uh, I imagine when you're looking at it, some, there's some times where you just, you just look at it and go, oh boy. Yeah, and there's other times you're going, wow, you know, that, that, uh, that came off really well. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's always room for improvement and everything. Totally. Right. But you can see, this is what I learned in kind of coming to some of the trains that you guys did is just kind of see how teams work together. You can immediately tell when a team works together and when it doesn't. And you guys have traveled around and worked and seen you were mentioning going out to Florida, Georgia, uh, those areas, spending time down in uh, in the South Florida area with with groups like that. You know, they're, they have a longstanding dog programs down there and whatnot. But you can tell when a canine officer shows up, whether or not the other officers have worked around that canine Absolutely. or not. Absolutely. Totally. Uh, now I can even see that, right? Uh, versus like a team that might, like uh, uh, a unit that might specifically work more frequently right. with uh, the canine handler. Yeah. Consistent training. Right. So, and some departments do a good job with this. Some canine units do a good job by maybe taking extra time to go train with these units or, or yeah. whatever. But, um, and I guess the point of this is with the, with the, with the sort of the body worn camera mm-hmm. footage is you see a lot of stuff. Yeah, definitely. And I think the, the big thing is it's really easy for us as canine trainers to Monday morning quarterback the dogs, because we see, even though it's just the small clip, we can see the details. We can see the nuances. We can see those tiny little things that we're like, Oh, red flag. or like, Oh, that dog looks pretty good. And it's not like, Monday morning quarterbacking tactics. It's not like that. It's a living, breathing animal. And we've we've learned to look for very specific red flags or very specific things, whether it's in person or on body-worn camera footage. Uh, that And it tells us a ton about the dog. So Steve and I can like, at this point, pretty much look at a quick video. And even though it's only a minute out of this dog's entire career, entire life, we can already have a good sense of, what's going on in that dog's head. And I think part that's partly through watching body cam footage of our police dogs that we know like the back of our hands um, and debriefing that with our teams mm. or even just the watching of videos, uh, the selection videos that we're seeing of dogs overseas and then seeing the product when it shows up. Yeah, that's true. And also separating when you watch body worn camera footage, there's things that you're separating, right? You're separating the dog which independent of, of the tactics that happen, independent of the, the handling, independent of anything else, you're just watching how is that dog performing and whatever he's doing, right? Foot bail, uh, pursuit mm. foot bail, right? The mm-hmm. dog launches out of the car. Watch how that dog runs, how he engages on the suspect, how he bites or doesn't bite, right? Looking at things like that. Uh, and then, of course, we're also looking at, okay, the training of the dog. How was the control? How did he get the dog off, 
off the bite. We're also looking at, you know, was this officer, did he seem like he was prepared to handle that situation through training? Okay. And I think it's also important that a lot of times when people look at all, the whole picture, they always put all the blame on the handler. But a handler, he signed up to be a police officer. He got assigned to be a canine. He doesn't know anything about canine. Where did he get his training? He got his training from his whoever his department told him, hey, these guys really, are experts. Really They're going to train you to be a police canine handler, do what they say, how they train. And, and he's doing he's doing what he he believes and has been taught is correct. I see that all the time. That's something that actually like really uh, sets me off a little bit is when people just consistently blame the handler, right? We literally call it BTH. We literally call it BTH, blame the handler, right? Everybody, it's very common in this industry to blame the handler for problems that are dog issues. Does that make sense? And that's something that, like Steve said, it, it completely infuriates us because this cop is not a trainer. He's not his, his role is not to be a dog trainer. His role is not to make the selection of the dog. His role is to have a dog in the back of his car, keep the, the training maintained to the, to the level that he understands and knows has been taught and to perform with it on the street, right? Mm -hmm. And if there's a missing link there on the dog side of stuff, that's on us. Gotcha. As the trainers, as the vendors, as the person providing the dog and selling the dog to this department, that's on us. And the trainers, the old school trainers especially, love to blame the handler. It's, it's never their fault. It's always the handler's fault. Never the dog they selected either. Right. It's, it's always the handler. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, I, that's a very good point. Like I, this is different because you're, you, it's not being like issued a handgun. No, like no. It, you mentioned that earlier, right. Or, or whatever. It's not a machine. There's a lot of things that go into this. And, and I imagine like with, when you go from department to department, it's probably something to talk about depending on funding, depending on what the process is. It can be very different from one department to the next in terms of how much training Absolutely. that dog actually gets yeah. and how much training that handler yeah. actually gets before they're out on the street. Am I right or wrong? Absolutely. Correct. I went and did these classes on the East Coast or in the South recently. And one big thing that I saw is canine teams over there get three, six, nine months to maybe even up to a year to get their dogs from green, get the team from green to com to completely wow. finished. Okay. We don't have that luxury. We no. get six to eight weeks, depending on the dog. That depending is not on, a long depending time. on the discipline. And I'm not talking about six to eight weeks to get this dog biting or six to eight weeks to get this dog um, just doing basic stuff, basic bare bone work. I'm talking about six to eight weeks, eight weeks, let's say eight weeks to get this dog. From the crate? From the, from, from the airport, doesn't know anything, came from Europe, been raised on a farm, to complete off-leash control in urban environments, because we live, the, the, the Bay Area is in an urban environment, uh, complete off-leash control, uh, the ability to search, find, and apprehend a human that, co that committed a crime, let go of that human and return to the handler completely off leash at on one on one command and on top of that also to search and find an alert to either guns narcotics or explosives and we have 8 weeks to do all that that's a lot meanwhile these departments on the east coast or in the south have damn near a year to get that same thing done and a lot of them aren't even doing that a lot of them don't, it's completely normal and industry standard for a police canine to leave basic handler, handler course or patrol school and not be able to be taken off leash and be trusted. So this is the thing, like, because I've seen the difference between control and not control. I've seen, so we, we mentioned COA mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah. I mean, that right off the bat, like there was a few things that I saw that dog do, like you could just visibly not really knowing what I was looking at go, Right, this dog switched on a little bit different level than the other three dogs I just watched do this exact same drill. Right. Yeah. Then it came to the, the what the 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 commands that the dog was getting in the again the similar environment, how responsive that dog was, how quick there was very little repeating of anything. It was like this is what we're doing. The dog was listening for that, but also being very focused uh, and all off leash. And there was one particular drill I think you guys call it like a walk back drill where. The, I, I don't know, this is probably not the right term, but the guy in the suit, uh, I think it was, yeah, yeah, is in the, is in the <laughs> yeah, closet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, Yahoo. Just takes a 
ass whooping, you know, however many days a week, but the d- guy's in the, at the end of the, end of the hall or whatever it is. And in a, in the closet, the dog, uh, he runs into the closet, the dog goes down there, apprehends, apprehends him. The guy comes and then basically the dog gets called off. Uh-huh. The dog gets called off to maybe, by the way, this would have been about a hundred feet oh, from the handler. A forward down. Yes. The dog is put in a forward down. So the dog is like 10 yards from the from the suspect that he's just let go, go of and handler's telling dog to down. Right. So that so basically that he's he's staying within distance. So if this guy takes off and runs again, the dog doesn't have very far to go to re-engage. Yeah. Right. right? So, and so then the 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 well the suspect is or sorry, the officer is giving commands to the suspect. Again, this is the guy wearing the suit to come closer. The dog is sitting. He's walking the guy in to the officer, mm-hmm. calls the dog back another 10 yards, downs him again, right? The suspect walks a little closer. And this, this series happened until ultimately both the dog is and the suspect are back to the, ha- to the handler. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the amount of control, like with the dog is switched on as it is at that point. I didn't realize when I was watching this happen, how uncommon that is in terms of, other departments yeah. and what, what they can do. Uh, usually you have to go in there and they have to pry their dog yeah. off of, you know, whatever they're, yeah, right, they're all on, that. right? Right. Um, can we talk about that a little bit and just like what the differences are? Because I I think people are listening to this going, that sounds like some some PSA type shit. That yeah. doesn't sound like what yeah. would be happening on the streets. What's mm-hmm. the re- reality of this? So the forward down is a very important piece of our police canines control, right? Obviously to get to the point where you forward down, your dog has to let go, what we call a verbal out first, right? The whole point of the uh, forward down is like you said, to keep the dog that much closer to the suspect if the suspect decides to turn and run. A good example to think of is you're searching like a tow yard and the suspect dog goes on bite, search, find bites, the suspect close to the fence, right? Dog goes on bite, uh, like let's say within a couple feet of the fence. If you, and you, and the team hopefully is behind cover pretty far away. um, And the dog was out there searching in front of the team, keeping the team safe, right? So dog finds the guy, dog lets go. And instead of recalling the dog all the way back, the handler now can forward down the dog, meaning the dog is in front, it's the team, the dog, the suspect. And that way, if the suspect decides to act like he's giving up and then pop up and hit the fence to get over, the dog is that much closer, right? Um, the forward down is is definitely uh, a staple for us and something that we spend a lot of time in foundationally to make sure that the dog can do it because it's something that's used on the street. We recently, one of our teams recently had a deployment probably about three weeks ago or so. And long story short, um, the the team used the Bearcat to pull the garage door off of a uh, structure. And the suspect was lying in wait in the garage. The dog uh, is deployed. The dog goes on bite and bites the suspect. The handler says, hey, suspect, show me your hands and I'll take the dog off. Suspect throws his hands up. He's literally screaming, I'm giving up. I'm giving up. Handler recalls his dog puts his dog in a forward down on the uh, on the driveway. So he's at the end of the driveway behind cover behind the Bearcat. Uh, dog goes in a forward down on the driveway and he tells the suspect, hey, stand up, walk towards me. And the suspect pops up, books it. Dip takes deeper, up. takes he's, up deeper into the garage, <laughs> right? And and now, now it's getting scary because what is he going back there to grab? Right. Is he trying to make entry into the home? What is he doing? Well, luckily, Handler, very experienced, very smart, very tall, uh, is able to... Uh, deploy redeploy his, the dog. redeploy the dog, and the dog is already has the advantage because he's that much closer. The dog apprehends the suspect again, and then they were able to tactically make the 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 smart decision. Um, we're not recalling the smartest, that dog. The smartest yeah. decision to take this guy into custody, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's a completely useful tool that our handlers all have the ability to use. And Steve and I think if we believe that if you have off leash control of your police canine, which you should. Uh, this is something that you should definitely be training because it's very, very useful tactics wise. And though everything that we do in our police canine training, hap- we do for a good reason. Does that make sense? There's a, a tactic, ba- a tactics based reason why we train the dogs to do that. And that is consistently from the day we started training police canines to now something that we've always harped on mm. and it's paid off. I wonder what you guys see as like being the biggest, um, 
like most common problem, you know, with when you see some like body worn uh, cameras and things like that, with just like, what's some of the typical stuff you're just like, we see this all the time and this you could easily be avoided or this is the prop, this is the reason this is happening. Is what, What's the most common stuff? I think for hands down for me, the first one is going to be off-leash control and the lack of. That's what I was just going to ask you yeah. because I was, I didn't understand how much that was true until I started really getting into this and watching it just going, why doesn't everybody do this? Because yeah. to me, it looks very normal, very controlled. And right. like every every dog there was, every dog in this particular training was able to perform that no problem. Yeah. Takes a lot of training, right? And also to get a dog to do these things that you see in training in real life, you have to train to a level where the, the thresholds for stress, for chaos are being replicated in training, mm -hmm. right? People always say, especially growing up when I was a kid, decoying for police officers always, oh, we can never replicate real life, right? Nothing's ever going to be the same as real life. Obviously, that's true. You can't replicate real life, but you can do other things to try to influence those similar things that the dog is experiencing. To the dog, even though, okay, it's not officers, it's not whatever is, is happening in real life, we're going to do something else to get the dog in the sta same state of mind and that same level of arousal or stress or whatever. So now we're practicing that control in a similar environment. I think the two things I see most often on body-worn camera are lack of dog quality, meaning the engagement was very, very weak right? The dog barely bit this guy or he bit the clothes or he didn't engage at all. Or it or, took way too much of the handler's influence to yeah, get the dog to bite. Yeah, that or the opposite. That dog looks really good, really strong, but that guy cannot control that dog. Oh, the dog's like out it's of control. It's one or the other, almost always. So is it, the dog happy that, medium. is it that the dog's out of control or, the, or that just, whose fault is it? Is it the, the dog? trainer. I was just, okay. It's the trainer's fault 100% if that dog is not under control on the street because that handler can only do what he is equipped to do, right? We Equipped see, and trained. Which is, which is give right. commands and... And we, we see handlers more. using like the electronic collar. That's our... We'll get, we can get into that. It's a whole other topic. The electronic collar is our bread and butter for off-leash control. But we see so many canine handlers come to us for the first time. They have their e-collar and it dangles around their neck or it stays clipped to their belt the entire training. And they give the dog seven commands and never once touch their e-collar to correct the dog. Right? It's a tool that's super effective. They don't even know how to use it. And it's no fault to that handler most of the time, sometimes you have handlers that are like, oh, I don't want to use it because I, I don't want to overcorrect my dog, right? But normally, they didn't come up with that on their own. Their trainer put that into in their, their head, head because they selected a very weak dog for that guy that if they correct it too much or over control, the dog shuts down and won't perform, right? Wow. So, that, so it's all tied together, right? Like the dog is too weak. So the dog's so weak that they're just worried about getting this dog to engage in the first place. So they kind of let it stay borderline out of control. So hopefully he's- Not gonna borderline. Play. Or completely out of control, right? Like, let's just let's just pat this dog on the back until he finally bites somebody, right? Or you have the dog that everyone makes jokes about, oh, he's he's an asshole, he's this, he's that. But the dog is actually a really nice dog, but just needs a caliber of training that can match. It's like it's like giving a, a kid that just got his permit a Ferrari, right? Of course, he's going to go take that thing for a spin and total it. But if you train that kid with good driving and you have a, I'm not a race car driver, but... Imagine instructor. You, sure. Yeah. You know, you give, you give that kid good instructions over the course of a certain amount of time and teach him how to drive. All of a sudden you have a team, right? That's winning races. It's the same thing with a, with a police officer. A police officer is not a dog trainer or a dog guy. It's a job of his instructor to give him to, sh he should be giving him a Ferrari and then giving him driving lessons according to that. What we see a lot is dog trainers are tinkering with a broken down Fiat and they're just trying to get this thing to get oh, out of the man. driveway and hope that it makes it to 7-Eleven. And so, right, that's and, a good analogy, but that's kind of where we're at. We see that a lot. To, to tie wow. back on to what Steve was talking to, we do our absolute best to get the street, I mean, get our training to look like what the it dogs encounter on the street. On the street. Yeah. We do everything we can. If you can come up with something, let me know because we'll add it to the list, right? You just mean in terms of like, we're going to give all, every scenario that could possibly exist. Not, not scenarios, look, but just stressors. Every yeah, every look. look. Noise, surface, uh, biting surface, it's, visual picture, whatever it is. So one of those things is it's not the suit every time. Well, that's that's a, that's a super important a point. One. And yeah. it, what's funny is when Steve and I started training police dogs, one of the biggest myths that runs in police dogs is, oh, it's all about the first bite. Once the dog gets his first bite, you're good to go. And Steve and I have learned that means absolutely nothing. The reason why people are so caught up on that first bite is because that's the first time that the dog is seeing a bite under that much stressor, under that much stress, because that stress wasn't replicated in training. Right. It wasn't brought to the table. We've 
Steve and I have gotten to the point where most of the dogs leaving our patrol school go and perform right away on the street and have multiple bites right off the bat with zero issues because we've done enough of a quality job making sure that the dog sees those stressors in training. And I swear the dogs don't even know the difference when it goes and hits the street and has these real deployments because it's like, oh, I've seen this before. No problem, right? So we are constantly watching BWC footage, whether it's our guys or stuff online, trying to see, trying to add more to the menu of what are we picking from today to, to, to get our dogs even that much more closer and even that much more comfortable with new. To the real deal, yeah. right? whatever that real it, new might be. That is where it does kind of matter on the handler for this reason. We can get a really great dog, right? There's some dogs you could have the most terrible training in the world that's going to perform. But even the best dogs, you got to show them some of the looks, right? That is where it is very important for the handler, not just the handler, but that entire training group, team, yeah. whatever you want to call it, to have buy-in, right? How So what I mean by that is you have some units come to training, everyone's got their energy drinks and they're sh shooting the shit, you know, chewing dip, spitting, whatever. And they all just like, all right, go, man, go get your dog. And they saunter over their car, they grab the dog and do the rep. Versus what we try to do is, hey, this is the scenario. Uh, canine handler X, Y, and Z, you guys are going to be role players. You're going to pretend that you're just normal officers. Handler... Z or whatever is going to run his dog. We need you guys to buy into this and make this shit real, right? He's going to bring his dog up. You guys are going to be the search team. We're going to make it look realistic. We're going to show the dog all those pictures and you have to get buy-in from that. What I mean by that is like the dog goes on bite on the decoy on the suit, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, hey man, bring the dog to us and we'll take him off. Hey, show us your hands. It's not this like lack, lackadaisical training mindset. It's realistic. It's the, the yelling or whatever might happen, right? Obviously, we want to also train guys not to be chaotic, but sometimes that's unavoidable, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're first by they're the guy that's next to them, especially in a small department where they don't have a lot of seasoned guys. They have a lot of new hires, right? Maybe their, their guy on their first bite is some brand new cop that's, that's deer in the headlights, freaks out, starts screaming, all this stuff, right? Or the handler just, it's his first time and it, and it just, that he happens, right? He loses it. We need to make sure that that dog is prepared for that. A lot of guys are like, oh, well, in, well, in real life, I'm going to be calm and collected. <laughs> Right. We see no. your BWC footage, bro. Yeah. It ain't happening. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so that's where we need to expose the dog to those things. Not because the dog's necessarily going to be scared of that or anything, but just it makes it look realistic, right? And now there's we're, we're just trying to do everything we can to minimize the divide between training and real life so that training is producing results that are going to be predictable. Right? And honestly, if we don't end the scenario with the handler taking a deep breath and being like, that was a lot. It wasn't a good enough scenario. And honestly, it's funny because we've taken over, especially recently, we've taken over a couple new programs that have a long history of being with other trainers and even some trainers that don't do scenario-based training for whatever reason. And they leave our training scenarios being like, whoa, this is fucking sick. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that is what Steve and I love because then they, not only are we testing the dog, putting stressors on the dogs, but we're also putting stressors on, putting stress on the handler and teaching them how to cope with that stress, how to problem solve during that stress, and how to deal with their dog during that stress. So not only are we actually helping the dog and showing the dog all these pictures, but we're making our teams more effective and making our teams more ready for the street. And at the end of the day, that's all we that's all we want. I like to say that our, our canine training on a normal day, we split it up between stuff that is designed to train the dog to do the skills that's needed right? That's specific for the dog. Those are not scenarios. We're just teaching the dog. We're practicing control. We're practicing gotcha. whatever, right? Yeah. And then the other part of it is the dog is where he is. We're going to train the handler how to utilize that tool. And that's the, the two things that are separated and then get intertwined, right? We do a scenario and hey, that dog didn't do this very well, whatever. Okay. Take it out of the scenario. Work, work the on that skill. as a dog training skill, mm -hmm. right? And then take it back. And that's how you identify things. That's also how you can find things through, through those scenarios or through body worn camera that we watch after a bite. Hey, the dog succeeded at this and he bit the guy, whatever, everything was good. But during this part, you know, you, you downed him in the hallway during the search and he got up three times. He had to tone it down a couple of times. All right, well, let's work on those forward downs outside of a scenario. That's how you can constantly just keep it. And, and it's not Monday morning quarterbacking. It's just picking things apart so we can improve those little things. It's just I, getting better. Yeah, no, I get better. it. I think a lot of people can get behind this. I mean, it's like yeah. your shooting game, right? Like you, 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 you run through a drill or you run through some type of a, um, like a contest or like a challenge or whatever. And you recognize, like you break it down, you break down as far as like, start. What, yeah, what, exactly. <laughs> like a cold start. What, 
what what are my deficiencies here? Yeah. And not let let's just run it again. Like that doesn't make sense. Like that run it again. Or, you know, as so, so you here, like slow down to get your hits. Like that's dumb because that isn't that isn't what we're trying to do. We're not trying to slow down. We're trying to go at speed at whatever the fastest we can or whatever the scenario is yeah, in this case exactly. and be proficient. So break out of it, continue to work at speed or continue to work at 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 this this particular skill. Just take this piece out and this piece out so that you can layer it back in later and see if you if yeah. you've if you and measure your improvement. Right. Yeah. So all I want to do is let's take a look at some body worn because you guys you guys are like, hey, there's a few things that we could we could take a look at here. You yeah. sent me a couple of links. We're gonna have um we're gonna have uh Eli and uh Ju over here pull up a couple of videos and we're just gonna kind of walk through them. Um I like first off is it's a highly I didn't look at it because I wanted to be sort of surprised. Yeah, yeah. So I don't really know what I'm about to look at. It's highly likely that I have seen it though, because I watch because I see because we were just going back to the DMs with the back and forth and stuff like that. And I'm totally enamored by by this type of work. So um as we're looking at it, maybe we we uh we can take take a second to pause at the end or whatever and just yeah. kind of kind of go through yeah. what, what we're watching. So, sounds good. And in a in you know, for those people that aren't watching mm. this, or if you are watching this, you're gonna see this this footage. If you're listening to it on the other end, you're gonna hear it in the background. You can go over to the YouTube channel, you'll be able to see it there, uh, what what we're seeing so that you you get a better, better uh, taste of of what this actually looks like. So one thing to preface before we watch this is none of this is meant to uh like criticize this guy, right? Like we just talked about. Or any of these guys. Yeah. The way we've gotten good with dog selection is by being hypercritical. And that's our goal to take that same mindset to handlers, not to say, hey man, you did a shitty job. Be like, cool. All right. How can we pick this thing apart and make this as good as possible? And that's all this is intended to be for other guys to learn. It's not meant to like knock right. on this guy, right? To totally get it. Yeah. yeah no, I, and I think that's, that's a problem actually out there in the space, particularly with cops and body worn cameras and, and everybody wants to Monday morning quarterback everything. I mean, there's definitely things that you can look at and it doesn't take an expert to go, that wasn't good. That didn't yeah. look good. Uh, but as long as it's being looked at like constructive, but again, I think it the context to it was all set already. Yeah. Like we just talked about selection process, totally. talked about training. We talked about, you know, dogs, handlers, what they're doing, what they're not doing, not, you know, whose fault it is. But uh, specifically, like, let's look at like the the overview and just kind of see what, what you're seeing. Because... Um, I'm interested, like I'm a freak, like from the performance training perspective, like I watch people move, I see how they approach problems and problem solve, you know, or go through workouts and things like that. And I, in my daily life, like I'll right. see people walking down the street and go, Oh, look at that. That ankle's wacky. Like what's <laughs> going on down there? Look at this. Yeah, <laughs> this person's back's going to be, got to be screaming by the end of the day. Look at that gate, you know, as they're running down the street, that kind of stuff. So I'm sure it's the same Steve for you guys. does that all the time. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's like, damn, that guy's got good form. Yeah. <laughs> Or you see someone walking, their knees are just darting in. You're yeah, like, oh my god! That's what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> see them running there like on mile twenty-five, and it's like, God, uh, just, yeah, that's not going to go very well. Yeah. Or on the flip side, it's like walking, watching somebody walk their dog down the street and being like, look how tight that leash is. Yeah, that leash could be so loose right there's now, no and the dog pleasant. could. Be, yeah, there's no who wants to get dragged down the street by their dog. You know oh, I saying? get that all the time. Like, oh my god, your dog's so well behaved. I'm like, she's just behaved. Like, <laughs> well behaved. I don't even know what that means. She just knows what she's supposed to be doing. It's, I paid a lot of money and I took a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, it's one, one thousand percent. Like yeah. we put in the time. Anyway, so let's look at people that probably put in a lot of time and a lot of money and uh, we'll see how this works out. Oh man, that... You can already see some so of the... dog's out in front of him and around the corner already. There's all kinds of obstacles here. Like I'm just watching this guy getting tugged around the yard. Tall grass. This looks all bad. Get your hands up! Get your hands up! Sure, it's okay. I stop. Get up! Up! Yeah, it's really hard to watch. <clears throat> Man, I didn't see that coming. This is the other angle. Yeah, this is yeah. the other uh, the cover officer for the canine handler. I believe he's doing a track here. Um, he's on the other side of the house, right? Okay, I got I got what you're so you're seeing that's this is the guy going over the fence. Yep. Do they both have dogs? No, no, just him. Okay. 
So he put his dog on the other side of the fence. He has this cover officer holding the leash for him so that his dog stays in place. Gotcha. Okay. So he's got... So at this point, the canine handler is just there with his dog. There's no lethal cover. <clears throat> and he's off to the races with his gun, gun guy behind him. Lethal cover. So, okay, so I see. Oh, then the dog gets... Oh, yeah, man. so at this point, the dog's on bite, and the handler's there on the ground shot. So dog actually is able to distract the suspect for a couple seconds and allowed the cover officer to uh, put some rounds on the guy. Oh, man. So... Do we know the outcome of that for that officer? Officer's okay. Officer uh, is out of the hospital um, and doing well um, from what I've been seeing online. Okay, so break this down for me. So the first thing that comes to mind is the long leash getting yeah. way out in front of the, do the, the handler for me around corners and obstacles that obviously the you can't see past as the as the guy on the end of the leash. Right. right. So other places <clears throat> in the country do this style of searching where they do a track and the track takes them to yards and they continue the track into the yard. Here, Steve and I have been blessed. You mean here like Bay Area? Bay Area, yeah. our departments, mm -hmm. we've been blessed that uh, they have, uh, in my opinion, used some of the safest tactics that you can use on the street as a police canine handler. And they train that anytime you're going to enter some sort of yard, structure, whatever it is, it is no longer at that point a track. It is now turning into an off-leash area search with the canine ahead. Okay. Obviously, I feel it It, it turns that, my stomach watching rough. this. That right? was rough. Because I know that if that dog would have been off-leash and would have been 20, 25 feet, 30 feet, whatever, ahead of the handler and the handler wasn't stuck on a line he you wouldn't know, have been pulled that close to the suspect. He would have been pulled that close to the suspect. He could have been behind a point of cover. Um, and the dog could have taken a lot of the damage that he took, right? At the end of the day, it, that is the police canine's job is to make sure that the officer makes mm -hmm. it safe at home at night. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Maybe this dog does have off-leash control. But from what I'm seeing in the video, that wasn't the decision made. And that led to the officer being shot. Mm. Um, it's hard to watch. It, it is very hard to watch. Is this like, a, so when I'm looking at this, and again, I don't, we don't know this department's policy or right. whatever, but the policy, are there policies where your dog has to be on leash? Yes, there's departments all over the U.S. that have policy that says the dog cannot be taken off leash or has, cannot, cannot be taken off leash unless X, Y, and Z. Um, many different options. And a lot of those are liability options on the department's end that these dogs don't have off-leash control. So once they're taken off-leash, they are going to bite the first thing that they see, right? And that is just, for me, that is a bad thing on the trainer side because that should be something that is Same trained level. day one and taken care of yeah. on the trainer's side. Let me ask, let me ask this. And that is, like, for me, I'm just, like, logically thinking about this. If that dog would have been on a short leash, let's say a three-foot lead, three or four-foot lead, and they get to that point where now we're getting into open space, like, we could, still could have done all the same things, taking the dog over the fence, had the dog stand by while he got to the fence, then got to the corner of that house, then maybe, you know, got through that open area that he was getting through and then getting into that space, he could have then tried to tried to search or waited for other officers to get there or whatever. Yeah. I, I'm just looking at it going like, is there a case where a shorter leash would have maybe put this in a better situation? Again, this is totally Monday morning quarterbacking it, yeah. but but I, I don't know. So I'll, I'll speak to the the off leash work, the way this would have, have gone down for like some of our guys if they had been doing something similar. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that a lot of agencies advocate for this on leash searching, right? Or that the reason it came about is because like Ricky was saying, they don't have off leash control. So they cut the dog loose. And like you said, the dog bites the first thing it comes in contact with at infinite distance, mm. right? One of the reasons people uh, shy away from off-lease searching is because they believe they don't have distance management, right? Because of that reason. Our dogs, especially that forward down we were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Coming back, mm -hmm. that can also be utilized in the opposite way. So 
he comes over the fence, right? He maybe he he waits for the guy that's on gun to come with him. So now he's got so he's managing his dog, right? Because that's his that's his responsibility is to run the dog, mm. right? He should be focused on that. And there's right. someone else with a gun watching out for not him. Not doing both, yeah. Watching out for him, right? Not not with his gun out, watching the dog search, watching everything else, and that is his job to protect that handler while he's managing that dog. He can kick that dog off for a search and with the forward down, he can stop the dog at any distance he wants. And right? avoid over penetration. Yeah. So let's say he, he puts the dog to the corner of the yard, downs him. Wait. Right? Wait a second. Let's figure out what we got. Maybe he sees the dog show interest, right? If the, do- if, if the dog's in a down and he sees somebody, you're going to see a, a obvious change of behavior. behavior. Okay. Massive change of behavior, right? Hey, he's got something. Now he can either say, hey, let me see what he's got, deploy him, mm-hmm. or call the dog back to him, right? And then work his work way again. up. Work again. Or work his way up to the dog. It just, it allows so much uh, versatility, right? That can keep him safe. Now his dog is never going to dictate what he has to do because he has to have the dog tethered to him. Oh, that's a good, that's a good point that the dog's dictating what's going on. The it's like going, the tactics. it's like going to the park and watching the lady get tugged around by yeah. the, you know, the exuberant yeah. Labrador or the huge doodle, you know, whatever, just at the end of the leash, the lady's arm straight and she's yeah. trying to decelerate. She's not in control. Yeah. I mean, a lot of agencies all over the U S allow the dogs to dictate the tactics what I would like to see is maybe how this exact call would have been handled with no dog. Is it just them walking oh, that's and, a good point. and encountering a suspect? Mm-hmm. Are they going to pie corners and hopefully see the suspect before? It's a great point. You know, before they did here, well, the dog dragged him into it. You know what I mean? The dogs should never, ever dictate tactics. They should make the dog fit their tactics. You know what I'm saying? And they can only do that if the dog is trained properly and the dog is being trained by a trainer who is giving them the option, giving them the control to allow for tactical options. Cause a lot of dogs, I'm not saying this dog, but a lot of dogs don't have that off leash control. And there's one way to use the dog. And that's at the end of a line or cutting it off leash in an enclosed area, knowing that the dog can't mm. go anywhere else, but that, but in that enclosed Got area. Got it. Got it. Yeah. That, that was, that's all. The, these things are always tough to watch and you're looking at it, man. And I, again, I, you know, interesting, you know, how, how this turns out. Uh, I'm good to hear that the officer's officer's okay. Yep. Let's move on to the next one. As the recording begins, it's 227 in the morning on Friday and DPD Corporal Scott J and his canine partner, Figor, are following a blood trail into a wooded area on Briggs Street. Dallas Police Chief you recognize him? Yeah, yeah, that's Eddie Garcia, man. I miss Eddie. The work of this dog used to be our police chief. Sort of heroic. Our canines are invaluable members of this police department and help save his partner's life. Three hours earlier, Thursday night, police say 20 year old Brian Casilla shot his mom and his sister when they complained his music was too loud, locked themselves in a room, and called 911. Officer Scott J and Figor found him hiding in the woods. It is then that you will see the tenacity and bravery and true heart of these beloved animals. As Figor jumps on the suspect, Casillas opens fire at point blank range. The bullet enters the dog's chest, exits through his shoulder, and then a rapid exchange of gunfire. The suspect was shot dead. The officer with bullets to his left leg. Suspect down, I'm hit. My partner's hit. And another lodged in his bulletproof vest. Here you go. Come on, buddy. But the officer insists on securing his dog first before he'll let the other officers help him. Hold on, let me get my dog, sir. Don't bite anybody. Let me get my dog. Other officers secure a tourniquet on his leg. The bullet in his vest was right above his heart. Come on, you're good, you're good. God wasn't ready for two warriors that night. And these warriors did their duty in the face of evil. Police are still investigating why the suspect did what he did that night. It's the third Dallas officer involved shooting just this year. All three have involved violent suspects who have shot at my officers. This is despicable and deplorable. Meanwhile, officers Jay and Figor are on the men. DPD tweeting this photo of the pair today, both expected to fully recover. Not only made a chief proud, but a department and a city proud as well. Wow. So kind of similar to the last similar, right? Very similar. So because searching for those people that can see this, they're sort of searching under the deck. It looks like of a house. Dude's off. So it's dark. They're under white lights. 
And uh, yeah, they got, but the dog's on a leash and he's kind of going around the pylons and the pillars and there's a bunch of shit underneath the deck and whatever else and kind of climbing around and obviously comes up on the suspect. Yeah. I mean, the, here the dog getting shot is completely inevitable. Shit back, in, inevitable. He, he's going to shoot that yeah, dog. Yeah, shit back he, suspect. He, knew. he planned, knew it was coming. It was coming. Yeah. Could the officer being shot been avoided? Yes. If the dog was, had off leash control and if the trainers had set up this team with the ability to perform off-leash control. Explain. Now, I'm not, I don't know this dog. I don't know this handler. I don't know who trains them. I don't know anything. What I do know is that this search probably, probably could have been done off-leash. And if it would have done been done off-leash, the handler would have been probably far enough back that they wouldn't have- It would have responded differently. It, it, would, have, it would have ended differently, right? Um, that being said, this handler is doing what he felt was right in that moment right. and what he's been trained to do. Um, my job, Steve and I's job as canine trainers is to give these handlers the option to choose whether they want to run the search off leash or on leash. Mm. And I am a true believer that stuff like this happens all around the country because they are not given the ability to do any sort of off leash searching and are not trained to that to that standard. Gotcha. Yeah. Important note here, just, you, just watching and listening to the stuff when I hear you guys, I, so tough to watch, you know, very, yeah, and, you know when you're watch. watching it and police officers, canines getting shot. Like I, 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 I can't think of, you know, these guys just went to work one day, you know, and they're, they're, they're just doing their job and it turns into this. Yeah. And thank God, like these, these two are, are recovering and doing better. So, so tough to watch. And then obviously stand back and be somewhat critical or mm -hmm. at least, you know, of, Hey, how could we have changed the situation? But the reality of it is, is this is exactly what needs to happen right across the board. And, and that's why these things are so important. So you can see like, okay, what happened here to how do we avoid this the next time coming through? Um, and it seems like in, in almost every case, whenever you have people sort of armchairing these things, let's just say AARing them, um, like what we're sort of doing now, there's going to be somebody out there that's had a similar experience and or has much different training, right? Totally. They've come at it from a much different angle. And so obviously they've got their own experiences and they're bringing their own, their own stuff to it. It's not to say that there's a one way to do everything, but there are ways, I think there's frameworks whenever you're looking at, at training like this, and I'm no cop. Right. But I've talked to a lot of them. And again, I get shared, this stuff gets shared with me and I talk to people about it a lot. I'm not trying to overstep my bounds here. I'm just saying like watching it, not to judge people on what's been right or wrong here, but just like, Hey, what's the nuance of this as compared to this other situation, which isn't the same, but maybe similar. And how do we, how do we look at it and, and clean it up? So for for you guys, it's, there's actually like another layer here because you have the dogs and the dog training, which yeah. is beyond the officer and the officer training right. that's layered on top of this. So it's even like a, there's, it's even like a, um, a more complex issue. Totally. Right? Uh, so it's like, you know, I guess when you're, when you're pulling it apart, it's even, there's, there's that much more to it. Right. So, yeah. uh, you, I just want to make that note, you know, for people listening, going, "Oh, you guys are just <clears throat> blasting me." We're not blasting anybody. No. Just looking at it objectively here, and and, um, and looking it from the view of a canine expert. It's, it, it's it, like, yeah, yeah, and it's also coming from a body cam, a body worn camera that does not show you all the other things. Not that even are, close. All, no. all the other things that are going on out there. That is one point of view, <clears throat> and it's not even the officer's point of view. Nope. Yeah, it's that camera that's sitting on his chest, it's his belly yeah. buttons view. Yeah, or whatever. So it's much, much different. Absolutely. I, the reason. The reason we do this too is, you know, this is the man that the father, the husband, whatever he is, right? That right. signed up to do this job that showed up and did that. The reason we're doing this is so that he got shot in the chest, right? The reason we're doing this is so that the next father, wife, husband, whatever, mm -hmm. that does this, that comes across a similar situation doesn't have to go through what he went through, right. hopefully. Right. And his family. Right. And, and his family. And his and department right? and his buddies and everything. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sure. And, and something to note about this, we were talking about the long line earlier. You mentioned it too, where it, it kind of seems chaotic, right? Mm -hmm. The long line is, is a crutch in place of off-leash control. And it's so many times we see it where the dog goes out, gets hung up around a pillar, gets hung up around a table. And all of a sudden you have this asset 
your dog that's right. in the wind, right? He you, he's stuck somewhere. Now all of a sudden, now instead of doing our job searching for this suspect, or whatever, now it's like great. Hey, my dog's stuck in this room that we haven't searched. You have to unfuck this. You have mm-hmm. to unfuck it exactly, right? Um, and so that's something we kind of saw a little bit going on here and a little bit with the other one, right? The dog jumped over the fence. The long line kind of got hung up, things yep. like that. But yeah, like you were saying, this is this is for the next guy. He's he's the hero that that went through it. The only reason we're here to talk about it is so that way we can help that next guy learn. Yeah. Right. And by no means are we anti long line. You know, we're not. We're just pro off leash control. Oh, that's a good way of looking at it. The long line. It. The long line is a great tool in a limited about amount of instances. But like Steve said, it's very widely used in this industry as a crutch, as a crutch yeah. for proper training, yeah. proper e collar work, and off leash control in general. The more tools you have, the better, right? It's just like people taking away the e car and saying we don't want to use off leash control. We're not saying take away the long line. What you just saying? have uses options tools, but some people use the long line. It's like trying to use a hammer to put in a screw, right? Some people are using the long line that way. Right? Gotcha. The long line's great for what it's meant for. Oh man, it's, it's another dark situation, right? Not so a lot of room to move. Always dark environments, lots of clutter, selection, right? Oh, he's under the house. So he he has no visual on his dog? No, but he can hear the suspect fighting the dog. Okay. Can we pull it back about 30 or maybe 45 seconds or so? Was that dog on a leash? No. Off leash. The dog off was leash. off leash. Got it. So... This this guy is laying on the ground in a very narrow, in a super narrow passageway. Right. So this is that same suspect. Earlier in the day? Uh, yeah. Earlier in the day, he took off. Basically, they did a car stop. The car was on the driveway. They, they, they went and talked to people and people took off from the car okay. and there was a gun found in the car. Got it. So that's kind of what's leading that's, to this. Okay. So, so if, you, if we go forward a little bit, so you'll see this guy actually, if we play, he'll act like he's giving up. There's no dog involved here. Mm-hmm. And it looks like his hands up. His hands are up. And now he's looking like he's thinking about going over that fence. See yeah. those hands drop a little yeah. bit. Starting to grab the fence, right? He's starting to grab the fence. He's like, he's feeling it out. He's like Boom, what can gone. I get away with here? Yep, straight up over the fence. See you later. It didn't take long. Okay. So so it ends up... we can, Yeah, it turns into a canine search. So we can fast forward. This is just the announcement being made. Yeah, so now this guy right. winds up right. under, Here's good. underneath the, ho- the house. Yep. This is an agency that practices off-leash searching e-collar work. Okay. Extensively. That is, that is their bread and butter is off-leash searching. So you see the dog is searching with it with within the team here. Uh-huh. There's an alleyway here. You can hear the helicopters going on. Yep. Right. There's stairs. There's all kinds of shit. Handler Let's... Handler has his dog in front of him searching off leash, and you can actually see the handler's handgun coming in and out. Right. So the handler's providing his own lethal cover and has the ability to do so because he doesn't have two hands on a long line. Right. Yep. And and so you can pie a corner here. Right. Yep. And what, what looks more controlled? This dog under verbal control or a dog at the end of a leash? Pulling an officer. Pulling an officer. So, yeah, what's marked right now is that that dog is just kind of going a certain distance that knows what he's supposed to be doing, knows what he's not supposed to be doing. He's not just... Uh, I look at this like bird dogging. Mm-hmm. Like you've got a, a dog whose nose goes to the ground, doesn't care what the fuck else is going on, mm-hmm. doesn't even have to see anything. It's just like going, going, going. Mm-hmm. This dog is very alert and kind of going, what, what's going on? What's over here? What's over here? Yep. But not getting too far from the from the officer. And while the officer is giving him commands, it's not like frantic. Right. No. It's, it's, not, it's not frantic. Cool, calm, controlled. Right. And you can also tell in this situation, the handler is a good distance away from the dog and the dog is able to turn those corners. The dog is able to check those bushes. The dog is able to check uh, on the deck, There's under the dog deck. Dog crates everywhere. Without yeah. the handler having to be there. Right. right. Dog's the first man through the door. 
Got you. That's the point, man. Right. So the handler sees this hole that goes into a crawl space under the house. He puts his dog under. He's got his own lethal cover, as you can see there, along with officers behind him. Got it. So there was no reason for the dog to go in there other than the handler directing him there, right? There was nothing stimulating him to want to go Correct, in there. Correct, because that, 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 that thing was open when right. he went by it. Yeah, right? there's nobody right. yelling back. It's just, that's a weird, open, scary-looking thing that he's got to put the dog through. Environmental confidence, right? That dog just went through because there's a possibility there might be something in there worthwhile for him. Gotcha. Right? And so, dog is able to go on bite and begin apprehending the suspect under the crawl space. Now, let's say you don't have off-leash control. You don't have the ability to verbal recall your dog. You, you now have to go fish this guy from under the house unless you have a long line. So that's where the long line has now become the crutch. And people are like, I'm not putting my dog under there unless you have a long line. Why? Because once he's down there, I'm not going to crawl down there and grab him. Well, why don't you have verbal control and just call the dog to you? Right. And then call the guy out. And if he doesn't want to come out, guess what? You turn into a barricade. So here's what I'm getting. Like if the dog's on a long line in this situation and doesn't have that recall, the dog goes on bite and you can't get it to out. No. Nope. So now the dog's on bite. You're attached to the dog, which is attached to the suspect. And what you're saying is the only way to get that dog back is for me to get Hold to the dog, dog to then get the dog off the suspect. So now I'm putting myself in close proximity to the, that suspect again versus this dog was on bite and giving this guy a run for his money and, ba and just gave the dog a command to let go and come back, which is yes. exactly what that guy did because he's giving up. Right. Right. And there's a little th bit of... Th that's a big difference between what we've seen happen and all yeah. the other things. In fact, in the last one, the dog stayed right there the whole time, right. even though... Because the guy didn't... Even, I don't even remember the guy even trying to recall the dog. Right. No. Because all it had just gotten bad. Right. Yeah. Right. It just, it just went all bad. So that's not really a fair comparison. But at the same time, like, I hear what you're saying now. Suspects on bite. Like, if I can... And I, I can't see him. I don't know where he is. Yeah. We can hear what's going on. Yeah. I, but if I, I give that dog a command and he lets go, which is one, that's a whole other issue, right? Then can also come back. Yes. Uh, uh, that's pretty, pretty controlled. Uh, obviously, obviously you guys picked these videos, right? Yeah. Obviously, this is a very good example of why off-leash control is a good thing, but I don't think it takes a, a rocket scientist to, to look at this and go, this is... This is a favorable outcome. I mean, we don't know. I don't know that this guy got get arrested. I mean, did yeah. he just, did he, just get, he just gives up? Yeah. Favorable. But, so yeah. here's another thing, though. Like, he was talking about the long line, right? So people don't have off-leash control. We set up a scenario like this in training, right? And they say, oh, well, I'm going to put my dog on a long line and put him down there. Well, once the dog's on bite on the long line, he's still in a small little crawl space. So now what are you going to try to do? Pull that guy back to you? While the dog's on bite, uh, like, yeah. You know, a 240-pound man. Like fishing. To pull him, it's not yeah. going to happen, right? Especially when your line has turned corners turned corners. And it's not a straight Yeah, it's right. But there's pillars, pylons yeah, underneath the same there. thing. The yeah. pylons, your, do your dog goes, dogs don't go point A to point B to people. Right. They hunt around. So your dog goes under this crawl space, goes around a pillar, comes this way, and all of a sudden, boom, he's wrapped himself around the line. Now your dog is down there with possibly a suspect, your dog's hung up. He now can't now you've just created a shit sandwich for yourself, right? Now you got to go fish your dog out. The suspect's down there. It's mm -hmm. just a disaster, right? That's an example of the long line is kind of the, the crutch for this tool, but this is not the right situation for a long line. This is where off-leash control is utilized. Right, because it's of the potential you don't obstacles know what's under and there, things, right? Yeah, things are going on. It could on. be a shit ton of insulation, right? Under a mobile home. We had a bite like that with the handler and the dog could barely push his way through there because there was so much shit, insulation, you name it, right? You do not want to introduce a, a leash into that situation, right? Yeah, so I guess my question would be, my next question would be after we sort of walk, is that it? Is that, is that the last one? Do we have another? One more. We have one more? Okay, one more because I have some questions. Okay, I remember this one. Right. I, I remember this one. So scenario is we, we're in a carport, right? It's very boxed in. There's only... There's really no way out because they got this guy boxed in right. here mm -hmm. with, with vehicles and with officers. Right. Uh, was this a stolen car? Yeah, so this suspect, as, as we play it, we'll see, but the suspect uh, at this point is wanted for 10851, which is the California Penal Code for a stolen vehicle. Right. So... It appears he's going to give up, but he's also clearly not all there. Right? Yeah, he's, he's, high he's messing fuck. around, right? He is high as fuck, too. And this is a handler. We don't train this department. This is a local agency. A handler is mm -hmm. very well known, very well respected. Like, he's the man, right? When, yeah. when new guys come onto the canine scene in this county, he's he's the guy offering a helping hand. Awesome yeah. guy. Right. Probably the most experienced handler this county scene in the past 10 years. 
Gotcha. It's pretty intense. Yeah. So this guy looks like he's about to give up, kind of. He's literally standing on the hood of the car. Right. Like this is this is wild. He's playing games. So right point. here, you'll hear the, you're, you'll hear the handler be like, "What's the want? What's the want?" And everybody responds, ten eight five one. And he goes, "Shit," or something similar. You see the look on his face, being like, "Damn, I can't." I can't, I can't, I can't let my dog go on this because it's not. Because it doesn't meet his department's policy. His department policy views a stolen vehicle as not enough of a serious crime. I don't know if their policy says dog can only be deployed for a serious uh, crime, serious felony. It could be violent felony. It could be violent crime, whatever it is. But meanwhile, this guy's jumping back into the car, getting into the driver's seat and... Yeah, and now he's just going to start ramming people. So this all could have been solved with a dog bite on the vehicle. Right. Whether he was standing on the car or when he turned around and started going back, back in into the, the car, car whatever right. it is, right? This guy's just ramming cars. Oh, I remember this one vividly. Ramming cars. Like, now there's a potential for a gunfire, right? Yep. And this is not a, a canine handler problem. It's not. This is purely a policy problem. That handler cannot depl- could not have deployed his dog prior to that. So now we have right. an officer on the ground. Getting run over by a car. Getting run over, dragged. Other officers trying to save him, putting themselves in danger as well, rightfully so. And shooting into the car. And shooting into the vehicle. Now a shot suspect. I don't know if he made it or not. I don't really care, right? Wow, what a shit show. Right. Oh, but just so you know, now the dog can be deployed. <laughs> because he threatened bodily harm. Well, because now he's probably what we call 245, assault with a deadly weapon. weapon right. Um, what a, you just watched that escalate very, very fast to, well, actually, I will I'll say the opposite of that. It didn't need to, it was starting to escalate and you could see it happening. You could watch like before yeah. you even saw I knew it was happening before it was happening when I originally saw this going, right. oh, I can see where this is going. Uh, but that's interesting. Like, I didn't even put the canine piece together when I originally saw it. So when you just brought this one back up, I was like, I didn't even realize there was a canine involved in the first time I saw this. Right. right. Experienced handler, experienced dog could have stopped the problem before it ever happened. Hands tied by department policy, policy. and probably thanks to a lot of other stuff, local politics, DA, city council, whatever it is. All those factors combined made the department make the decision. I don't know when they made the decision. It could have been years ago. It could have been recent to restrict the policy to what it is now, which is probably serious, uh, a serious crime, violent crime, violent felony, serious felony, whatever that, it is. But that leaves a lot of gray area, man. leaves a lot of gray area. And the department made the internal decision that 10851, a stolen vehicle, does not, not meet the criteria and is not a serious crime. Keep in mind that Every serious violent, most serious violent crimes that happen are with the help and with the aid of a stolen vehicle, right? Shootings, robberies, um, yeah, you know, yeah. home burglaries, commercial right. burglaries. A lot of the times, what what is their main use? What is their main trans- mode transportation? Mode of transportation? It's a, it's a, stolen, a stolen, car, stolen car, right? But in this case, it's just a stolen car. <clears throat> Dog can't be used for that, and I. I'm telling you right now that if the dog was used in this case and if the handler's hands weren't tied... All of that could have been avoided. This avoided. entire problem would have been avoided. Yeah. This is a great case for like... Most times in these situations, the presence of that police dog would make that guy say, I'm good, I'm done, right? That's that's like 90% of police canine more. use of force. More. Use of force. Not actually it's biting. It's a show of force. It's a show of force, right? Which is counted as a win for the dog. The dog made this guy surrender. This guy that, in this case, got shot... He surrendered completely peacefully. Didn't even have to, didn't get right. touched, right? That Gave up, said, I'm done. That's the other this. outcome. Yeah. And so this this could have been the 1% that turned actually into a dog bite and could have avoided all of this. All, and, yeah, and all this, the rest this of This is it. all due to politics and and department policy. Again, not handler, right? This is, he, he didn't have a choice. He could not deploy his dog. You see him actively, he's ready to go and that dog's hot. You can tell that dog is about the life, right? Right. And he wants to go and he can't. And this handler has to choose between deploying his dog and saving the day and losing his job. That, in his house or whatever else, yeah. Or, yeah. and losing the ability to provide for his family or let this And now, now he's got to go home. He's got to think about all of this. Like, 
could have, would have, should have, but couldn't because, because there was no department for him, right? Yeah. And how many, how many police canine bites that we we don't know could have ended up like this had the dog not been used, right? We don't know because it never happened because the dog happen. stopped it, right? That this could have been one of those cases. 100%. Right. So it's interesting. So this one's a little bit different because this is about like a restriction because of policy, which escalated yeah. into something else. But those other things. So when you guys watch those things, and we've talked about the whole, you know, off leash thing. When you see stuff like this, I, it's got to go through your head like, all right, so the other ones were, we were really talking about the the off leash control. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you, when you see other things like, I guess with the, like the armchair quarterbacking, AAR stuff, however you want to look at it, are, is there, can there be things done at this point? Like it's so late, maybe this is not the, the, the better question maybe is, is like, at what point is it too late in the process to, cor to correct a lot of the stuff that we see out there with poor deployments or, um, you know, dog won't go on by or, uh, you know, just poor, uh, poor technique or, you know, poor, yeah. poor training. Like, can't, because obviously you can't train it. You guys can't train everybody, right? That's not what you're trying to do. You're just trying to bring awareness to this. Like, how, how do we, how do you rescue those dogs that are like fives that need to be yeah. eights or tens, right? How do you do that? It's dog dependent. It's right? case by case basis, yeah. 100%. Okay. So it, it depends, right? The, the dog has to bring enough to the table for us to work with it, right? Does that make sense? Yep. So the dog has to bring enough capabilities that me and Ricky can say, Hey, we are dog trainers, right? Obviously, we have our type of dog that we like, we, but ultimately, we're dog trainers. Our job is to train a dog, right? So this dog brings enough. Now it's our job to be creative. Hey, we can make that dog work. Yeah, we would never have selected him, but he's got enough that he brings to the table that we can get. It's like a tube of toothpaste, right? We want the tube of toothpaste that's brand new. Okay. Right? Some of these dogs are half full. You can still brush your teeth, that toothpaste, right? And some of them are the ones that you're like, it's been in your drawer for a week yeah. and you're still trying to go and make it work, yeah, right? Like, Damn, I forgot to get some at the store. Exactly, right? Yeah. And so it's all dependent upon that. And then, okay. and, and we'll see that pretty quickly when we start working with a new unit. We'll see this dog. And it's pretty cool too, because then when we bring this to the administration, after we take on a contract, we can say, hey, look, due to training or lack of training, all the dogs were at this point. Now, due to better training combined with genetic potential or lack thereof, this dog with the exact same training has accelerated to this point and this dog is still sputtering down there. Mm -hmm. And we've done everything we can and he is still, he had bad training before. Now he's got good training, but he's still not showing. But look at this dog. This dog is all of a sudden, you wouldn't even recognize him. Right. Yeah. So that, I mean, obviously if you've got to go back to a city council or whatever at that point as an administrator and go, mm -hmm. I need some more money to get some more dogs to fit yeah. this criteria, this is the outcome or this is the benefit of making sure a, we have the right dogs, but B, we have the right training. They're, they're probably a little bit more likely to write a check. I wonder what the reality is, is like when you guys get with these new departments and you see, you go through that scenario, mm -hmm. like how many, uh, how, yeah. Well, yeah, like how do. often do you run into how did this even happen? Right. All the time. Gonna, right. And then also like, what's the discussion? Like, look, man, this fucking dog has to go. Like yeah. he, this is a this is a liability for a lot of reasons. This dog has to go. I know you have all this money and training into it, and your mm -hmm. officers connect connected to it or whatever. But no, like I can't. Like I can train a dog, but I can't this get can't this work dog. miracles. I can't yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. it comes down yeah. to two words that we like to use: officer safety issue and liability. Yeah, and those, those are, are those the, are big buzzwords. And those are, are the two words we throw out right away because. You could hand an officer a gun that malfunctions or has a problem, and they will take care of that issue immediately. You can have someone that the department invested time and yeah. money to put them through the academy and get them into FDO, and they're continuously failing, continuously not doing well. And guess what? They're Give fired. that person the boot. Right, they're fired. Why? Because it's a liability, and it's an officer safety issue, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a safety issue with the public. But all of a sudden, when it comes to Canine Shep is not, it, no, not happening. Work through it. What? It's mind blowing. It's the mind blowing only unit in, in, in policing that has that so deep rooted. That's interesting. I mean, I had, and Steve and I get our, I really looked, I mean, you guys, that, that was a very good case. Right. Like in all those cases, you're right. Like you can't stay here. Right. I mean, you could just say the wrong thing and get fired. Yeah. It's a you tool. That, if it's defective, it should be replaced. It's a really right? good point. It's a very good point. And like I said, at the end of the day, Steve and I just want to make sure that these guys get home at, at night every day and hopefully that the dog helps them get home safely. 
And I don't know how some of these admin go to sleep knowing the dogs that they're putting with their canine handlers, let alone the trainer. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, the trainer is responsible. The expert. Yeah, they should be telling the admin what is and what isn't. Yeah. yeah. Steve and I go to departments and when when they take when they bring us on, immediately what we do is evaluate. Evalu- evaluate each dog as its own individual case. Right off the bat, there's some dogs that were like, hey, this isn't going to work out. Right off the bat, there's some dogs that were like, okay, we are going to try our best. And very rarely are we like, oh, this dog's a rock star. Actually, I don't think it's ever happened. But <laughs> <Not once>. um, <laughs> and then we are very quick to write memos and send those up the official chain and be like, this dog is an officer safety issue. This dog's a liability. Got to go. So going back to like the training points, going sort of uh-huh. circling back to the beginning. Yeah. You know, you guys were going through the selection and how important that is. And you were going through the different uh, traits that you're looking for. And you go through this training process. One or you need to, you know, we start with obviously coming out of the crate and figuring that out yeah. as a, because this is a seasoned dog. Or when I say seasoned, I just mean it's like a, it's a couple of years old right. when you're seeing it. And yeah. so when you go to these departments, they're obvious these dogs are what? two years, three years old, maybe, maybe older, yeah. but at least that old. So right. they've got time under their belt. Uh, but you take them across the, to the junk pile, you watch them kind of, uh, you know, do whatever they do there. And then there's these other things that you train them through. Yes. Uh, and there's, there's different pieces to this. And I know you guys have a real process to this, but when you get to these departments and they've already been trained and you have to sort of untangle the sticky web, um, what are like the, can you take them through the entire process that yes. you would start from scratch with? Yep. Or do you have to modify this to make this work? Both. Yeah. So if you're, as far as, uh, and Ricky can speak to like the training side of things, but as far as like the way our testing is set up, it doesn't matter if this dog is green. All he knows how to do is be crazy at the end of the leash and bite a bite suit and that's it. Mm-hmm. Or the dog has been a police dog for four years. The way that testing is designed and we've developed it over the years if the dog is going to pass or fail, it's going to pass or fail regardless of training. Uh, okay. Because of the way it's designed and the way we, and it's not necessarily just the testing that we're doing. It's also the critical eye you're bringing to the uh, behavior that is being shown during that testing. Does that make sense? Like, yes. Yes. Every, everybody says they test for the same thing in this industry. Everybody. They say, oh yeah, we want environmental soundness. We want hunt. We want the blah, 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 blah. But those definitions of what is good hunt, what is environmental soundness, there is no definition. It's all completely subjective. One guy says, no, that dog is completely environmentally sound. He's good. He just, he, he spooks occasionally and he, and he recovers fine. To us, he spooked, right? He should not care. So that, that's where we can take these new dogs, test them and see all the, the holes. Gotcha. Or, or, or not, rarely. Yeah, and training-wise, it's completely dog dependent. It always comes down to the raw genetic quality of the dog. But training-wise... Most of the time, like Steve said, like the dogs that are going to make it are going to excel really fast. And the dogs that aren't going to make it are always stayed, stay, always stay low and are always struggling. Right. Um, and training wise, we completely adjust our training to what the dog needs. Cause mm-hmm. if there's four dogs in a unit, one dog might not need much and we can probably just throw it into our, our maintenance schedule and it will just flourish. And some dogs literally need day one oh, okay. of this is where we're, this is where it's, and, and honestly, those day one dogs are probably the dogs we're trying to get rid of, right? Um, but some departments have told us, nope, and we got to do what we got to do and do our best. I think there's another there's another component to this too, and that is dealing with the handlers. You know, yes. as you're walking Ooh. into that culture, Boy. right? And that being like, if you're telling them their dog is not oh, good, God, yeah. <laughs> like, and they're going, they're probably taking that personally, right? I mean, I would. And they love to use the excuse, my wife. Oh, my wife loves him though. My wife, I don't give a shit. Yeah, this like, is, it's a tool. I hope it's your tool. wife wants you coming home at the end of the night because right. this dog is not going to assist you with that. Yeah, th- I mean, that's a hard truth, right? If, yeah. if that's the case. So yeah, how does that culture, how does that work in terms of you guys going in again? You're not cops. You haven't been cops. And you now you're entering it as, again, that's a thing in and of itself. Yeah. And they're being voluntold. <clears throat> you're going to this training. Right. Right. Yeah, you're, right. you're going here and these guys are going to tell you what to do. Yeah. And again, there's this like mm-hmm. feeling out process. Who are these yeah. guys? And handlers that didn't want to come to us. The one guy in the unit that was like, I don't want to go there's to those guys, but everybody else did. Always a cancer. Right. There's always someone. Cancer, yeah. But then there's also, there's also the, uh, you going in and very, very quickly looking at it going, <laughs> No, this yeah. dog, right? And so with the, maybe within minutes to, to hours, you're already looking at a, this could be a veteran officer who's on a second dog or whatever else. And yeah. he's he may be top of the heap, 
you know, so from a from a hierarchy perspective, you're looking at that's a shit dog. Yeah, yeah. At, and you got to tell them. Yeah. How does how, how do you deal with that? Like, how does the like from a business perspective? <laughs> I mean, you guys aren't 50 years old like me. Yeah. Right. So there's that yeah. part too. I'm just gonna be really honest. Like, you guys are young guys coming into this, and I say young because I'm a, a practically 50, and you guys are, you know, more than half my age. But at the same time, like, yeah. you know, it's there's a there's a thing there's a stigma there, and, and you have to acknowledge that, right? Yes, I'm, sure you guys, I'm sure you guys deal with that yeah. shit constantly. You dealt with it when you started in your business, which Ricky, you articulated when we got into this, but how does that, how do you manage that, that hierarchy, that culture? You have to be, I don't know, I've watched you guys both work with stuff. You guys are fucking in charge. Like I've, I've seen that. I was very impressed. The very first time I saw it, I was like, <clears> oh, these guys have that shit handled. And these guys are listening to every hanging on every word, but that doesn't just happen. So how do you deal with this dynamic as you're walking in these apartments? Because if I'm an administrator, I'm very concerned with this. See, seeing yeah. is believing. I'm very concerned. Yeah. I, I, I think dealing with a type A man's mm. emotions with an animal is first off <laughs> shocking because people it's like, like 10X yeah, dealing uh, with a dude, a type A dude anyways. Oh yeah. Dude, like just like and their dog's an extension of, you know what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. And that, honestly, that, I'm glad you brought that up. And I don't know how we didn't bring that up because that is the hardest part. Because if you go to admin and you have a handler by your side that's backing you up yeah. and, and, and and telling their admin, this is not working out. This dog is going to get me killed. It, it makes Steve, myself, and a pissed off handler are a force, a force to be, to be reckoned, reckoned with. Yeah, yeah exactly. gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Steve and myself against an admin and against an, uh, a handler that thinks that their dog is going to cut it. Yeah. That's a bitch, bro. So, yeah, yeah, that's a bitch, dude. That's Some why I said stuff. seeing is believing. And th what I mean by that is we show up to training, right? And let's say their training has been pull the dog out to the grass field, send him for a bite, choke him off the bite, take him back to the car and bullshit, that's it. bullshit for 30 minutes. And we throw in some scenarios to test the handler and their their skills as a canine handler, or we just put in a, a hard test for the dog. And for the first time in his life, that handler sees his dog let go, Crumble. Run, run away. What's with the famous quote, Steve? But send him back to the car. My dog's never, my dog's oh, never yeah. done that. My dog's never, oh, my dog's never, never done, done, done that before. before of course right? not. Of course and, not. And, and a lot of it comes from, we'll do something that's hard on the dog. That's like challenging, right? The dog comes in and you, instead of, instead of just laying in the corner or just showing him your arm and waving it, you, he comes around the corner and you're there with like, a bo cardboard box and you're just like, Wah! and you come Making charging nerve. at the dog and all of a sudden that dog just like has this look and bolts out of the room like like scrambles so hard he like falls down and books it. Like a cartoon. And the handler's like, like giving the bite command. He's like, Stellan, Stellan, Stellan. And the dog is just, just running away from him past him. Oh, so that, that goes- You don't have to say a word. That goes one of two ways though. And he goes to the handler being, he's like, our shit is like, our shit's fucked up. We need to fix this. This is un unacceptable. I cannot believe my dog did this. Or you have the handler who's like, fuck you. That was way too hard on my dog. Like, blah, blah, blah. And if that's the, if that, if that's the case, usually those guys, you just, you just write it out, let them work their dog. Hey man, yeah, you're up. Cool. Okay. Whatever. He's going to run his dog till he retires. The guys that are, that buy into that, those are the guys that are like, okay, this is different. Like that's unacceptable. This is supposed to be my police dog. And he just got ran by a cardboard box. Are you kidding me? then those guys are, are the ones that buy in and they're about it, right? And now we have something we can work with. And that usually works out for the most part pretty well because most of these guys, they're type A dudes. They don't want a, a dog that's a pussy. Right? Well, but part of they the, see it as. Yeah, part of that is too, I think, you know, this is what I've learned is like canine selection, for, to be a canine selection, they just hand these things out most of the time. I mean, some office, some departments they have, there's a process for going through this. You have to interview, you have to want, you know, oftentimes you have to want to do it. You know, yeah. like there's a line. Yeah, good police canine programs, it's a fight to get that. Right, That's, it, exactly. He's and, been waiting his turn and he's finally got it. Finally got it, so he wants to perform. At 100%. any normal police department, and I say normal because there's the big ones like LAPD where, where canine's its own unit that, mm. that... It's a different animal. Yeah, and it's under the Metro, you know, uh, umbrella, which is a complete different entity. All they do is canine. All mm -hmm. they do is canine. A normal police department up here in the Bay Area where canine is a, a piece of patrol still and still responds to patrol calls. When that canine handler shows up on scene, he is running that call. And that's a super important part that a lot of people forget because who knows how to work with that tool better than the canine handler? Right. Not a soul, right? You Even, even an experienced uh, officer that has, I don't know, 20, 25 years on is going to step back 
and let that canine handler run that call because that guy knows how to use this tool best. So when you join canine, you immediately go up in hierarchy and you immediately are respected in a different fashion because of what is at mm. the end of your leash. Right. I mean, that, that dynamic has got to be a challenge anyway in any kind of training, right? When you're yeah. going in as the outside guys and coming in, but you know, you guys have had enough experience now where I'm sure there's been some really good experiences and some probably some pretty poor ones. And yeah. it doesn't do you any good to be fighting with your handlers, you know, and your dogs, <laughs> yeah. right? When you're trying to help them be better and go right. home at the end of the day. So obviously that has to be managed, but I also understand there's a pecking order in life and there's a hierarchy yeah. and you need to understand where you fit into that as the hired, the third party hired that's coming in, that's doing yeah. this. And so that balancing or that juggling act of running a business, but all and and trying to be um, a resource, but also somewhat of an authority in a environment where you're an outsider, you're an outsider, and there's a lot of alphas, yeah, right, and just like the dogs, yeah, right. So you you just have to establish yourselves in it, maybe in a little bit of a different way. I would think that uh, again, yeah, if when if you see enough successes, and you guys see a lot of successes. Yeah. But if you're just like, look, we just got to get a few wins here and we can turn the tide. I, I wonder if that's the strategy more often than not. Just like, hey, okay, man, just yep. do your thing. And then all of a sudden those other three dogs are outperforming the salty yeah. guy's dog yeah. and him, right? Because he's being very resistant to this whole thing or whatever else. And the next thing you know, you're like, look, you can be on, now you've alienated yourself. If you don't want to be part of the team, don't be part of the team. But these guys are are going to be yeah. the, the, the the guys. Yeah, the get best thing the best thing to do is just lead the pack, turn around, say, let's go. And whoever comes, comes with. And whoever doesn't, doesn't. But eventually, that last guy is going to hear that let's go and be like, okay, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. And it's a it's always a very professional conversation, right? Obviously, you show if the dog is having severe issues that needs to be replaced. We're showing that. And then it's a professional conversation of like, you know, obviously, we joke around like, oh, yeah, the dog's a piece of shit, whatever, between me and sure. him or whatever. But was him is like, hey, look, this is what your dog did. This is what we're identifying. This is what historically has not happened or has happened. And you and you show them the failure and you explain with your professional knowledge why that's not going to work out. And if 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 the guy wants to be a handler and operate a tool, 90% of the time, those guys are like, that makes sense. Mm. Hopefully my admin goes along with it. If the guy is not that guy, then that's the dude that's like, oh, well, like I believe in my dog. I think he can do it, blah, blah, blah. Well, see, like, what did you just see? Like, mm -hmm. and then, then it's kind of just like Ricky said, you just, all right, bro, everyone else is going to, going to go. Hopefully you finally realize you're getting left behind. And then maybe hopefully you eventually join the pack. Hope that mm -hmm. that's the unfortunate thing is that guy that does that. The reason we're so passionate about, about fixing that and bringing it to him and being dogmatic about it is because he is going to be the guy that, that night could go respond to a call and his dog runs away. Right. Yeah. And what we're trying to prevent is him having to have either a really embarrassing failure a really or a really dangerous failure that finally is the knock on the head that says, wake the fuck up, dude. Come on, we've been trying to tell you this shit. Yeah. You've hit rock bottom. Yeah, we don't want that to happen. But sometimes like- Let us help you stand up. The unfortunate thing is in policing, the school of hard knocks can be life or death. Right? Yeah, we don't want it to get to that There's very little room point. for mar mar right. margin for right. error. Yeah, man. I, I think um, the extent to what you guys are doing uh, and how you're doing it is, is I think is fascinating to me. I know there's gonna be people listening to this and be like, man, I had no idea, you know, all this stuff. They don't really think about it. You know, there's gonna yeah. be people that have no idea about this whole world. And you've just given them like, you know, a crash course in education. We've looked at some um, body worn camera footage. We've talked about different types of dogs. We've talked about puppies. Yeah. <laughs> We've talked about leadership. We've talked about, you know, business organization and, and, uh, and growth and scaling things and the challenges there. There's been a lot in this thing. Um, and I, I continue to see you guys, you know, picking up new contracts and doing new things. We're just talking about the, uh, the new, the, the, the schools that you guys are running on a regular basis now. Yeah. Uh, it's really amplified in the last year, uh, from what I can tell. And, and I know like there's, there's, there's a growth process for you guys, but for people out there that are, that are, that are wondering like kind of, okay, so these guys work with these departments, but what else are they doing? Like, how else can I get some information? Cause you guys are very good about giving information to like, what are the things that you guys have going on where people can find out more about you or find out more about what you do and share this knowledge? Yeah, I mean, I think Instagram is going to be the best way for okay. people to get to us, whether you leave a comment, send a DM, whatever it is. I mean, my hope, Steve and I's hope is that this reaches that canine handler that is the black sheep in his unit right now is trying to do stuff different and not do it the way that they've always done it and is watching videos on Instagram, listening to podcasts and trying to figure it out 
we will help you. That's an interesting approach. We, yeah. Steve and I, want to be the, cat- the catalyst and be the catapult to help you get where you want to be. And I, I don't care if you do it behind your unit's back or in their face. I don't care. But if you want to get home at night and you want your dog to be better, we will do whatever we can to help you, even if it's via video, via FaceTime, via text, via email, whatever it is. Send either Steve or I, Spectrum Canine or Spectrum Canine Steve on Instagram, a DM, and we will do whatever we can to get you where we want you to be. I have to say this, like that officer you're talking about that's working really hard to get better, that's the one that I want showing up yep. when, you know, my my mom has to call, you know, 911 or whatever. That's the person that I want coming Absolutely. to the door. 100%. Or shows up with their dog, not that's crusty old like, salty oh, dude that guy. who's that got an attitude who doesn't want to be told the truth. He wants you to tell him what he wants to hear, not what he needs to hear about his yeah. thing. So. I think that's an important thing. And I think there's a lot of people out there that are struggling right now too. They're in like, they're in an apartment, they're in a situation or they lack confidence or whatever else. They just don't know what to do uh, at a lot of levels, not just on canine units or, you know, canine officers, but they are searching and they feel like they are that black sheep. And if they raise their hand up too high, uh, I just had this analogy used on a previous podcast. It's the, uh, the monkey paradigm. Uh, they feel, he feels, you know, they feel like the monkeys are going to beat him yeah. know, or beat him down. Yeah. Uh, and then that turns into like, well, I'm just not going to say anything and I'm just going to suffer or I'm just going to get yeah. through this. I'm just going to keep my head down until again, we, we talked about that margin of error yeah. until you show up to that call and you're thoroughly embarrassed or worse or worse, you know, or whatever else. Embarrassment is the lowest level that it can, can be. It can go, you know, obviously to, yeah, to the ultimate, ultimate, which in this line of work is, is uh, life or death, as you mentioned. Yeah. So you got you got um, you got Instagram as a way to get out there. I know you said you guys are traveling around a little bit, doing yep. some conferences yeah. or doing some talks or. We whatever. don't care where you are in this world. We will bring us out. We will do a class. We will do our best to educate. Um, and we're also uh, just recently with our last handler course started um, doing a shadow program where officers, canine handlers, trainers from wherever can come hang out with us for a couple weeks, watch how we train brand new dogs, brand new teams and get them from completely green to completely off leash, ready to go in any situation, anywhere in a very short amount of time. Um, another thing that's, that's cool that we've, we actually have in our upcoming class, we have two dogs coming from this sort of thing. We, you have our contracts, right? Departments that we train yep. weekly, but we also sell dogs to outside agencies and we'll put on that basic canine handler school for a department that's out of state or does their own thing in house, but we can still supply them the dog that has met our criteria, put them through that basic six week, eight week long training course Mm -hmm. where they go back to, you know, their own training, to their own training, but with, with set of skills, obviously dog training is very perishable. So, you know, Mm -hmm. it needs ongoing work. That's why we have our contracts and we train them every week. But at least those guys hopefully can get some sort of set up for success, set for success, right? Not, not going to a school wherever they may have been going or they get a dog they cu- that comes back and they're they're worried about getting it to out or the dog's scared of floors, whatever the case may be. You're hand, you, that shit's been handled. Yeah, that's been handled, right? right. They're, they're set up for success. Now all they have to worry about is staying on top of the training and controlling the dog and maintaining it. Yeah, right? I think that's a huge value add. If you get a dog from me, I'm going to make sure that yeah. you're set up for success that the dog, dog's... You're, you're, you're putting skin in the game. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. You're putting skin in the game with that. I think that's... That's important. I don't think we go back to how this all happens. Yeah. Like I'm a third party vendor, so whatever. Yep. I get paid this much. You want dogs? I'm. It may be a little tough for me to find dogs, so I'm just gonna. Uh, that's probably a three, but I'll call it a five. Yeah, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And, and that perpetuates itself in a, in, a, in a bad way. What else do you want people to know about you guys before we sign off, man? We uh, love what we do. Yeah, yeah. We we're love, not stopping anytime soon. I love it. Yeah, we do this stuff like. This is our job, but we really care about what we're putting out there, right? Like Ricky, we were talking, I think, off camera earlier. Like if we, if we're supposed to have six dogs, eight dogs in a school, right? That's a payday. Eight dogs in a school is a payday. But if we can only find five, six dogs, whatever, we'll tell whoever came last, whoever signed up last, hey man, you guys got to wait till the next school in six months because the dogs are not in demand. We are not going to sacrifice our standard to fill a spot. Quality doesn't come overnight. These dogs don't grow on trees. We wait till we can get the right dog 
And it's not like we're waiting around for them to come to us. We are actively seeking these dogs out constantly. Like me and Ricky are constantly hitting up our sources for dogs all the time. It, it, it's Steve. And, de- <laughs> and deselecting dogs constantly, right? So, uh, oh, I know you're deselecting them because they wind up in my Instagram DMs like, hey, this dog didn't cut it. You know, anybody that wants it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, I mean, that's, I get those things from Steve a lot. Like, yeah. just, hey, man, this, Steve's out there busting his this ass. This one didn't make it. Every day, yeah. messaging Dutch people, arguing with Dutch people, <laughs> doing all sorts of shit. And I, I just get to say, no, I don't like that dog. <laughs> trying to move trying on. to decipher the broken English. Like, what? Yeah. what is this? <laughs> Meanwhile, he's dealing with the open sores on his hands from his puppies chewing on him all day yeah. long, or in his arms. And yeah. Whatever. But, but so uh, got scabies or some shit. It's like Ricky said, man, like we really care. We really care about what we're putting out and we, we want those guys to succeed, right? Like we care so much. Like we want to see that. We don't want to see issues. We want to see that guy succeed. That's why we started this. Me, me and him started this as teenagers, as friends doing homework with our dogs in our trucks, going to a park afterwards and training the dogs and learning it. And that's weirdos. Yeah. Weird. Right. <laughs> On a Friday night. Weirdos. Super weird. Love that. Yeah. But that's how it started, man. And that's how that's how the passion developed. That's how the skill developed. That's how everything developed. Was me and him, friends, volunteering our time, learning our skill, and then it just grew from there. And that's that's something we don't ever want to stop, right? We're at we're we're where we're at now. We believe we're putting out a good product. We're doing a good job, but we both know there's things to learn, things to improve upon, and that's what we're constantly trying to do, right? That's why we're so hypercritical of. Everything. Everything and our own shit, right? Because we want to see, yeah, we've been doing that for the past two years, but yeah, get rid of that. Let's, let's push forward. And every handler course we do, we do slightly different and we evaluate the prior handler course and be like, hey, I didn't like the way this turned out. Recently, mm-hmm. we were talking about the way we were introducing searching to our, our new police dogs. Mm-hmm. Hey, I didn't like how we were having that guy just run into the building and sending the dog off to search because the dogs are a little bit too visual. I want them to be more nose-based. So let's start our searching in a nose-based realm, right? Little stuff like that, always constantly changing and it never stops and it never will. Yeah, that's the, I think that's a big difference between like good coaches and those that, that, that are constantly stand by, this is the way we do it because it's the way we've always done it. Oh. Yeah. You know, yeah. right. And, and the, just run it again, you know, and hoping you get it right this time and hoping it, it, it turned the outcome is the one that you want. And Insanity. then, and then saying, Oh, that was a great out. That's exactly what we expected to do when it was more luck than anything right, else. Right, right. Right. When you're playing a game of statistics, um, yeah, that's not a good one to be playing. Well, like I said, I, I, I obviously I'm huge, huge fans of you guys. Uh, super biased, and and I, I wish you nothing but success going forward. But at the same time, I think that's that's just a thing because uh, there's no doubt in my mind you'll continue to be successful. You guys have already proven that out. Uh, sky's the limit, right? You're yeah. straight to the moon with this thing. I have no idea what that would mean uh, or how I could help you, you know, beyond this. But if there's any way that I can, I can provide anything beyond, you know, getting the message out there, then you guys know all you got to do. All you got to do is ask. Yeah, dude, we love it. Thanks for having us on. Like, this has been awesome. We're so pumped to be here yeah. to share our story. Don't forget, Scott. Malinois are like potato chips. You can't just have one. <laughs> uh, so CC's over there going, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I've been trying to get more than one for a while now, but I, I got to be honest, like uh, after hearing this and kind of looking, you know, hearing and learning more and then actually seeing how the pup, like I always said, like, I don't want another puppy. Like I want a, like a two or three year old dog. I saw your eye twinkling. Oh my God. That dog was so cute, man. You can just like, raise one for us for a year, get the puppy fix, and then we'll take it from you when it's too much to handle. All right. All right. We don't got to turn this yeah. into a business. <laughs> <transaction>. <laughs> and it will be a divorce. That's what's going to yeah. happen. So anyway, like I, like I said, I just want to thank you and the rest of the crew for coming in and joining us tonight. I love you guys. Uh, you guys have a, a fantastic uh, rest of your evening. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother.